The Super Nintendo, a legend in the realm of video games. Undoubtedly, one of the greatest, if not the greatest console ever made. Some would say that real video games started on the Super Nintendo. Not me, of course. I made a top 100 NES games of all time video after all. And I had so much fun doing it that it took me two full years to work up the courage to do another one. Remember, just because your favorite game is not on the list doesn't mean that I don't enjoy it or that I think it sucks. The Super Nintendo library runs deep and there were many more worthwhile games on the system than the 100 listed. Even going a hundred deep, there were some tough cuts I had to make from this list. Adding to my struggle, unlike last time, I am allowing Super Famicom, or Japanese games, on the list. And true to form, in character for me, lots of RPGs will be appearing. And by lots, I mean 28. 28 RPGs will be appearing. Feel free to count along. But enough foreplay, you see the title of this video. Let's not waste any more time, starting with number 100. Super Mario All-Stars. I'm going to get this out of the way first. Whenever you're ranking Super Nintendo games, you're faced with a unique dilemma. What exactly do you do with Super Mario All-Stars? If you somehow don't know what it is, it's a compilation of Mario's 1, 2, 3, and Lost levels redone with Super Nintendo graphics. You can be cheeky, you can put it all the way up at number one, but that's cheating! Let's say, for example, that you believe that Super Mario World is the best game on the Super Nintendo. Not saying that it's number one, because it's not. Spoilers. You would, by default, need to put Mario All-Stars above it, because there's Mario All-Stars plus Mario World. So it has to be better, right? So how does one approach making a list like this? Should it be the best 100 cartridges you can buy for the honkin' thing? And if that's the case, then, sure, pen in Mario All-Stars at number one, and while you're at it, put Tetris and Dr. Mario in the top 20, and then I need to give another slot to the Ninja Gaiden trilogy, then I'd probably need to give another slot to Williams Arcade Classics. There's not enough spots. 100 sounds like more than enough to include every game that I personally like, but when you start actually filling it out, and the tough decisions need to be made. Every slot is such valuable real estate that I don't want to waste unnecessary slots on these compilations. And if I want to be really strict about how one cartridge equals one slot, then the All-Stars conundrum can take up three different slots. One for Mario World, one for regular All-Stars, and then another slot for All-Stars plus World. So my compromise is that number 100 is going to be the token spot for every cartridge that contains multiple games in one. If you want to be the ultimate smartass, then you could just say that the number one Super Nintendo game is the FX Pack Pro, an EverDrive that you can put every game on. All of this is cheating. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Bottom of the list it goes. Mario All-Stars is number 100. 99. Star Fox and Star Fox 2. I know, I know moving from one controversial take to another. But I was never a fan of Star Fox. Any of the games, not just this one. It was revolutionary at the time. Fully rendered polygons on the Super Nintendo. That's insanity. But if I search inward and ask myself, do I think Star Fox is fun? The answer is no, not to me. If I were a pure psycho, I would just leave it off the list and not even mention Star Fox. But this is one of the most iconic titles on the system, so it has to be in here somewhere. Is inserting Star Fox all the way down here at 99 somehow more insulting than leaving it off the list altogether? Honestly, I'm not sure. Star Fox 2 has more going on, but that arguably doesn't even count because it wasn't even released until 2019, and even then, still not physically on a Super Nintendo cartridge. Crap on me in the comments all you want. In fact, do that. Leave your angry comment right now about how I'm disrespecting Star Fox. And you know what? This may be a running theme with the next few entries because... 90 Eight, pilot Wings. Another well-liked first-party technical showpiece. This was a launch title designed to show off the Super Nintendo's ability to scale and rotate sprites, also known as Mode 7. It's not as much a flight simulator as it is a landing simulator. You spend most of your time taking off and landing rather than traveling places. I enjoy it okay, but it always felt half-baked to me. As if there should be another half to the game where you're jumping on platforms or walking around in RPG town which then transitions into the flying, but no, you just get the flying. 97. 
Mario Paint is not a video game. It's an early 90s creative suite. It came with a mouse and mouse pad. It allows you to draw pictures, compose music, swat flies, even do basic animation. This is another hard one to slot because it's more of just a thing you kind of fuck around in than it is an actual game. Today it's hilariously limited, but for the time, before every household had a smartphone or even a computer, this was a fantastic creative outlet for a kid to have. Countless artists, content creators, even composers cut their teeth on Mario Paint. This was one of Nintendo's best ideas of the time. 96. Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem is the first RPG that I have reviewed to appear on this list. Mystery of the Emblem almost breaks my Mario All-Stars rule because half of it is a remake of the original Fire Emblem for the Famicom, with its second half continuing the story from there. I hit a nasty soft lock in the first half, and it really soured my opinion of this game. But even I cannot deny what a massive step forward it was for the strategy RPG genre. Compared to the first two Fire Emblems, this was a huge improvement in just about every way. 95. R-Type 3. I don't typically do shooters, but I forced myself to try a little harder than I normally would to find some that I liked. And R-Type 3 is a lot more impressive to me than something like Gradius 3. It is all the horizontal shooting action you may crave, but what set it over the edge for me was this rotating stage you need to maneuver through. Though who knows, maybe I'm just easy to impress. 94. Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run I fully expected Tecmo Super Baseball to claim my token baseball game slot, but Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run sort of blew me away. The other Ken Griffey Jr. game is the one everybody always talks about, but Winning Run is bonkers. Get a load of this. It was developed by Rare, which made my eyes perk up right away, but look at these graphics! This batting screen looks like a PlayStation game. They used the Donkey Kong Country technique of rendering full 3D models, then making sprites from those, and this is one of the most impressive graphical Super Nintendo games I have ever seen, and that goes for all games, not just sports games. 93, NBA Jam slash NBA Jam Tournament Edition slash College Slam. I would rank NBA Jam much higher, but it's undisputedly better on the Sega Genesis. I've always hated how the Super Nintendo version doesn't have any music during gameplay. It's still fun. Tournament Edition is almost the exact same thing as regular NBA Jam, except you can sub in an extra player now, and there's a fatigue system, and College Slam is just NBA Jam with college teams. Teams. So all three games share the spot for being almost the exact same thing. I like NBA Hangtime too, but not quite as much as NBA Jam. Hangtime is subtraction by addition. Its animation is incredible for a Super Nintendo game, but it's nowhere near as fun. All these NBA games are pure arcadey joy. They only superficially resemble basketball, but that's okay, because the NBA Live series, on the other hand, on Super Nintendo, was an incredible technical showpiece, but the thought of playing an entire game of live makes my skin crawl. Meanwhile, NBA Jam is infinitely pick-up and playable, and you're always going to have a good time. Even if, while well, you're playing it on the Super Nintendo, you wish you were playing it on the Genesis or the PlayStation or the Saturn or really anything that wasn't the Game Boy or Game Gear. 92. Earthworm Jim and Earthworm Jim 2. Earthworm Jim and Earthworm Jim 2 are also ranked this low because, well, they're better on the Genesis. A lot of the times you can tell which system multi-platform games of the 16-bit era were designed for and which one received the port. And the Earthworm Jim games are prime examples of Genesis games that were retrofit to work on the Super Nintendo. It doesn't sound as good, it's not as smooth, but it's still Earthworm Jim, it's still a creative and inventive game, a classic, a generation-defining title if you will, and it deserves a mention. 91. NHL 94 and 95 and 96 and 97 and 98. Noticing a trend with these last few entries? Third game in a row where the rap is excellent, iconic, 16-bit era classic, but it's flat out better on the Sega Genesis. That version is faster, the ice is bluer, and it just controls much better over there. 
NHL was the series that kickstarted EA Sports Game Empire. Madden may have came first, but in the 90s those games were never that good, and they never touched Tecmo Super Bowl either. Anyway, NHL 94 is actually five players. A rarity, requiring the multi-adapter and another controller plugged into the second slot. So that's awesome. All the NHL games are mostly the same in my eyes, but 94 appears to be the consensus best one, and I'm not really sure why, but I'm also not really a big hockey buff, so the the intricacies from game to game are mostly lost on me. If you had to pick one, I guess pick 94 because everyone says it's the best, but you really can't go wrong with any of them. 90, Rock and Roll Racing. The last few games were docked some spots because they're better on Sega, so here's one of the opposite. Rock and Roll Racing is basically just RC Pro-Am on the NES, except for the fact that they licensed classic rock songs such as Paranoid by Black Sabbath or Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf. You know, a real who's who of boomer radio. The game itself is fun, I wouldn't have put it on my list if it wasn't, but the star attraction is of course the Super nintendo sized music. It's a decent game which is put over the top by these incredibly cute songs coming from your Super Nintendo. 89. EVO The Search for Eden is a game I was much too hard on when I reviewed it. This is a wholly unique concept, one of one, there's no other game like it. You begin life as a simple fish eating smaller fish trying to survive. Then as you progress through the game, you choose which attributes you want your species to adopt as you slowly transmorgify yourself into all sorts of wacky things. That's a cool ass concept. And say what I want about all of its other failings later on, it mostly delivers on that awesome concept. So, you want to play something different? Here it is. It's pretty short for an RPG too, only about six hours long. So, check it out, why not? Number 88, Tetris Attack. When Jason asked me to pick a title for his top 100 SNES games video, I decided I'd go with a genre that doesn't seem to get a lot of thought in these kinds of lists, the humble puzzle game. And with that in mind, is it any wonder that I picked 1996's Tetris Attack from Intelligent Systems? Despite the name, this game isn't actually based upon Tetris, but is instead a localization of Panel de Pon, rethemed around Yoshi's Island which came out the year before. And what a retheme it is! The graphics are adorable, with gorgeously high resolution lovingly drawn art of the cast almost always visible, but surprisingly most of the soundtrack actually remains the same as its Japanese counterpart. It knows just when to chill, just when to switch to an upbeat version, and the mixing never gets muddy. You can always hear the pop 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 of blocks being cleared. If you've played Panel or any of the later Puzzle League games then the mechanics should already be familiar, but if you haven't, you're in for a treat. The player is tasked with clearing a pile of coloured blocks continuously rising from the bottom of the screen and controls a cursor that swaps two blocks horizontally. Lining up three or more matching blocks in either direction makes them disappear, leading any blocks above to fall and potentially creating satisfying cascades and combos. Large enough combos will even stop the blocks from rising for a short period of time, resulting in an engaging feedback loop that hits that perfect one more try spot. There's plenty of game modes to keep you busy, even in single player. Endless play, which just gets faster and faster and keeps going until the blocks reach the top of the screen. Time trials for clearing a certain number of lines in a certain amount of time. Two separate campaign modes under stage clear and verses. And a puzzle mode full of little brain teasers that test your knowledge of what tricks you can pull off. It's all great fun and it keeps the game fresh for a surprising amount of time. In short, I'd say Tetris Attack is by far the best puzzle game on the Super Nintendo. Its clever mechanics, well-designed challenges, wonderful visuals, and mellow soundtrack bring me back time and time again, and in my opinion it's a must-have for any collector. Eighty-seven. Toy Story is a cornucopia of gimmickry. The 3D inside the claw machine stage is super well known, but what about the one right after it where you need to toss these aliens in front of the claw so you don't get grabbed? Or the RC car stages? Or the Pizza Planet stealth level? Or the one where you ride on Rex? Or the one where you need to put away all the toys into Andy's toy box? Every stage is something completely different, its own unique gimmick, and I love games which throw everything at the wall just to see what sticks. 86. Space Megaforce 
I'm not a shmup guy, but Space Mega Force won me over. It's so chaotic. Everything moves at an exhilarating, stable speed. When you think of shmups on the Super Nintendo, you normally imagine something slow and plodding, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. There's tons of power-ups, and they work Super Mario style, as in when you get hit normally, you don't die, you just lose your superpowers. I had fun trying to figure this one out, and with this, I have fulfilled my quota of shoot 'em ups I am contractually required to include, so... Yeah, let's move on to the real games now. 85. S.O.S. When Jason offered me to make the guest entry for his list here, I said, Aw, okay, I'll do Earthbound. No, 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 Chrono Trigger. He said no. He said you should do S.O.S. You'd like it. Never heard of this game in my life. So, I bought a copy of S.O.S. on eBay for around £300. Dump the ROM and then put it all on to my Super Famicom Mini. Let's dive into possibly one of the greatest SNES games of all time. It begins with opening credits, like it's a film. In your story crawl, you find out that you're a passenger on a doomed vessel, the SS Chrysanthemum. Then you choose between four different characters to play as. They don't really have any different abilities, just different objectives, like Caprice Wisher whose main goal is to save his sickly sister Amy. She's kind of walking around this ship, talking to people, and then suddenly... No! It has to be a game design nightmare to try and make a cohesive game out of an upside-down ship. Striking balance between playability and realism. In SOS, you're just some guy. You can only just do some guy things. So you're jumping off the ceiling to open doors, using staircases as monkey bars to climb up to the lower levels of the ship. It's insanely disorienting, and what's also insane is that, going back to level design, it never feels like this upside-down ship was made to be traversed this way. Because it wasn't. But that's the wild thing, because that's also the whole game. This game's map is incomprehensible to me, and that seems on purpose. Even though you can look at maps on the world to try and get your bearings, the map you see is right side up, so you'd have to reverse all your directions. Aya. If Caprice is here and Amy is down here, then I need to be climbing up and heading left. It's lunacy! As you explore, you find other survivors who you can then lead around with a very basic stand right here command. They're quite dim, but it's cute that you can help them with the platforming. As you explore, the ship periodically shifts left and right by varying degrees, and you are completely at its mercy. It's all too easy to hit a dead end and be stuck for minutes at a time waiting for it to shift back to a position where you can hopefully retrace your steps. This makes matters worse because there's a one hour time limit to finish the game. And so, but yeah, I couldn't figure it out. I looked up a long play to get some tips and realized that I'm not doing all that work. SOS is a very cool game. I think it sucks, but I appreciate the novelty in the era of video games where people just try and stuff out. Thanks for the recommendation, Jason. Very cool game. Glad you only played it for one minute before you handed it off to me. The absolute no. <laughs> 84. The Death and Return of Superman is not a misleading title. Superman dies at the end of the second stage in this game. Then you play as these fake imitation supermen. Blizzard made this, that's noteworthy. It's a standard beat-em-up, but done well. What's weird is that before he dies, this is Superman? Why are mere mortals able to just walk up and beat the hell out of Superman? His death scene is bizarre too. You just kinda awkwardly run into each other and Superman's dead? Is this how it went down in the comics? Somebody tell me, I'd actually like to know. 83. 
True Lies. I did not expect to have nearly as much fun as I did with True Frickin' Lies of all things. Never seen the movie, never even heard of this game until I was just trying out Super Nintendo ROMs for this list. It using the same sound font as Shadowrun got my attention, then you shoot somebody and it's bloody? This is just a pretty good overhead shooter. But it has some nice variety such as this bit where you're running downhill with these guys on skis chasing after to you. It's a simple game where all you do is run around and shoot people. The controls are responsive, so what more do you want? Sound like fun to you? Because it sounds like fun to me. 82. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. As a fighting game novice, Mortal Kombat 3 is my favorite one of the 16-bit era. I know for whatever reason 1 and 2 are more popular, but 3 feels the least stilted to me. All of these games have cheating asshole AI. It's like they only allow you to win a fight or two and then it makes sure you lose no matter what to get another quarter. Well guess what, we're not in the arcade, I'm not feeding you quarters, I already bought the game, just let me win, Jesus. Every move you try will get blocked, they'll have impossible reflexes when countering jump kicks or sweeps. I picked Ultimate over regular 3 because it has more characters, more game modes. It's exactly what the title says, Mortal Kombat 3, but Ultimate. It was like a Stone Age DLC pack. One that cost $70 when it came out. No kidding, and that's mid-90s money too. 81. Act Razor. Two. Infamously removed all of the town building and playing god that made the original stand out. Gorgeous, one of the best looking, but ball-bustingly difficult games on the platform. I've always wanted to get good at ActRaiser 2 because I respect the hell out of what it's trying to do, but its stages are so long, oftentimes with more than one boss fight. It's a much tighter action game than the original, but it's missing that same spirit. ActRaiser 2 is still a good game, but it's just not the same as the original. 80. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is not to be confused with any of the other various Power Rangers games. The good one is simply titled Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. It's a 2D, one plane, side scrolling beat em up. It's pretty easy, you'll probably be able to beat it your first time playing in one sitting, but it's fun hitting things. I like the boss designs, I like how you start each stage as just a regular guy or gal before you transform into the Power Rangers halfway through. I know absolutely nothing about Power Rangers as a series. It was popular before my time, but I still enjoy this game. When I first got into collecting Super Nintendo games in middle and high school, this was one of the first cartridges I got, and I would run through this game all the time. It's a fun little snack food game. It's not deep or anything, but it scratches a certain itch. Probably even more so if you're into Power Rangers. 79. The Ignition Factor. Jalico's magnum opus. I've reviewed this one in the past. It's a firefighter simulator. One of two on the system, believe it or not. There's a certain amount of memorization required, but I managed to finish this after a couple of attempts. What you might not expect from a game like this is its sense of humor. It can be downright goofy at times, and the ending is just your guy giving out about how he has to do all the work while all the other firefighters just stand around. 78. Vegas Stakes is a Vegas casino simulator with a dash of personality thrown in. You pick a companion, can get your wallet stolen, play slots, blackjack, roulette, poker, hire prostitutes, then do cocaine off their backsides. There are many gambling Super Nintendo games, but this is my favorite because it goes that extra mile contextualizing itself. You're not just at a casino, you're on the Las Vegas Strip, and it commits to that idea. It's all a bunch of window dressing, but when your game is as simple as playing poker, that window dressing is what makes all the difference. 77. Super Star Wars and Super Star Wars Empire Strikes Back and Super Star Wars Return of the Jedi are games that I wish I was better at. They look fantastic and they're notoriously difficult. I've never been able to get past the first couple of stages in any of them. Something about Star Wars as a franchise just lends itself so well to video game adaptations. These three are all just about the same game, so I'm not going to split hairs and break them up. They're solid side-scrolling action platformers with Star Wars bed sheeps draped over the top. So what's not to like? 76. 
Equinox. Hey guys, it's Dan here from Jason Graves' Top 100 SNES Games video. Everybody's favourite Top 100 SNES Games video. In the formative days of gaming, it regularly fell on box art to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it came to conveying a game's aesthetic. See, while early graphics may have been capable of sketching out the general idea of what was meant to be happening on screen, good game art filled in those gaps in the player's imagination, and functioned additionally as an advertising tool. Because it's just common sense that when picking out a game to take home, kids are always going to favour the ones that look the coolest. Games like Castlevania 4, Super Metroid, and Contra 3 these stunning artworks that conjure images of Simon Belmont whipping his way through Dracula's castle, Samus Aran exploring alien worlds, battling their hostile inhabitants, or Bill Riser and Lance Bean single-handedly fending off extraterrestrial armies. So when presented with this depiction of a mystical caped adventurer, staff in hand, pursued across earth, sea and sky by devils and hydras, how could your expectations be anything but through the roof? So this is Equinox, sequel to the NES game Solstice, the artwork for which was described by the game's own designer in the November 2007 issue of Edge magazine as embarrassingly bad and having nothing to do with the game. So I guess identity confused box art is a trademark of the series. Right out of the gate, Equinox wastes no time at all establishing its story, characters and setting. In fact, it doesn't waste any time explaining itself whatsoever. As the game starts, we don't know who this guy is, what he's meant to be doing, or why we should care. Which isn't a great starting place. And it's worth noting that none of this is clarified along the way. The relevance of plot in games is a long debated point of contention. But when presented with this... Well, I'd have appreciated something to go off. Visually, what can I say about Equinox that your eyes haven't already told you? I wouldn't describe the graphics as bad exactly. They're just kind of unappealing, and don't do anything to help the predominantly ugly environments. And the environments aren't just ugly, they're also forgettable, which is extremely unfortunate since it turns out the whole game is reliant on the player's ability to navigate through it. Everything that can hurt Glendol, oh that's this guy's name by the way, whether it's a weak enemy, strong enemy, end of stage boss, spike or a gate, kills him in one hit. So get used to this noise. Sometimes he manages to be killed even when standing on platforms that should be out of harm's reach, and a lot of times you find yourself apparently catching the edge of a hazard despite not actually appearing to make contact, which heightens the tension by a fair bit. Traversing this room, for instance, feels akin to crossing a floor full of broken glass while walking on the whites of your eyes. Initially, I chalked these quirks up to hitbox issues and just general bugginess, but it's stranger than that. And the longer you play, the more apparent it becomes that they did this on purpose. Hello? Dan, I said we could put this crappy game on the list, this horrible game on the list, but you're going long on me. I said three minutes. You're going four and counting. Are we about ready to wrap this up? Um, I did kind of have a few more things to say. I don't suppose you could link my channel in the description. And I can finish the video there. Yeah, I, I guess I can put a link to your bullshit down below. As well as everyone else who contributed. Down there, in the description. Alright, cheers mate. Get out of here. Number 75, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, is the most difficult video game ever made. Oh, 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 stop. I see you. Don't you dare say that you've finished it because I know you haven't. You know you haven't. You're a liar and you know it.
Maybe with save states. But even then, I still don't believe you. It suffers from shoot 'em up syndrome, where if you ever get a game over and need to continue, you're better off resetting the entire game because starting with just the water pistols would actually be what fighting zombies with a super soaker would be like in real life. Passwords are worthless too for this reason. It's a fun action co-op game for about half an hour. Then it gets impossible. There's loads of personality, great music, but again, it eventually gets untenable, and this game is way too damn hard. 74, Umahara Kawase, is a game I tried because Tim Rogers said it was great, and it almost feels like a modern indie platformer. You control a little girl which has to do basic platformery stuff, the hook is literally a hook. You carry around a fishing line which doubles as a grappling hook. And you can use this thing almost like in getting over it with Bennett Foddy to fling yourself all over the place. Imagine if just messing around with the whip in Castlevania 4 was turned into a crucial game mechanic. That's almost the feeling you get with Umahara Kawase. 73. Front Mission Gun Hazard is a game that not a ton of people know about, but the ones which do say it's incredible. So much so that we may have reached the first non-Mario All-Stars game, which could actually be some people's number one. Well, it's not my number one. I wasn't immediately blown away. I think it's an interesting game. It was made by Square, which were the masters of their craft on the Super Nintendo era. Aside from Nintendo themselves, there was no greater seal of quality than that Squaresoft logo. Front Mission Gun Hazard only came out in Japan, so it's got that forbidden fruit syndrome. Even though it's a Squaresoft game, it's not an RPG. It still has RPG-esque elements, I suppose, but at its core, it's a 2D action mech game. And, in my humble opinion, you could do far better as Super Nintendo mech games go. Sometimes less is more. You don't always need all this story stuff. Like, shut the hell up, I just want to shoot things. A couple of mech games coming up later are more straightforward, and as a result, I prefer both of them to this. 72. Every single Koei strategy game. Koei, during the Super Nintendo era, loved to make these way too complex strategy, almost board-like games, which really belonged on early PCs. They ported Civilization to the SNES for heaven's sake. If any game screams, don't play me on inferior hardware with a D-pad and four buttons, it's that one. And it's not like Nintendo's port of SimCity, which may or may not appear later on in this list, where they made heavy alterations so it would make sense and actually be fun to play. Koei just went for it, man. All of the most complex, non-user-friendly behemoths. Gemfire, Genghis Khan 2, Clan of the Grey Wolf. Liberty or Death, an American Revolution simulator. Operation Europe, based on World War II. Nobunaga's Ambition and its sequel, Lord of Darkness, which are based on the Japanese feudal civil wars. Even its RPG spin-off, a Nindo Way of the Ninja, carries some of this DNA over. Even something like Aerobiz and its follow-up are insane. They're airline company CEO simulators. The most non-video game-like things. Koei was punching well above their weight, bringing both ports and original games which had no business being on the Super Nintendo to it. It's crazy that one of these mentioned games exist, let alone a whole company specializing in weird, clunky, PC-styled simulation games. But God bless them for it. The world is a better place with the Koei Super Nintendo library. 71. King of Dragons. Originally, I had Knights of the Round on this slot until I actually started playing the games, and what I found is that Knights of the Round was way too slow for my liking, and this game called King of Dragons apes its style while being more fun to play. It's not as visually impressive, but if you plonk both of these games down in front of me, I'm going to pick King of Dragons. Both games, believe it or not, were developed and published by Capcom, and both games were also released in April of 1994 in America? Why would the same company cannibalize itself like that? It's so strange, and history will show that Knights of the Round won. That's the game everybody knows and talks about. But King of Dragons, man, try this one out. It's great. 70. Super Mario Kart would go on to be the worst Mario Kart game. 
but also the best one on the Super Nintendo, obviously. This game is kind of a slog unless you're playing the battle mode, but giving birth to one of the highest selling video game series of all time alone means that it's worth putting on my list somewhere. And while I would still reach for this way before Rock and Roll Racing or something, I would rather play any other Mario Kart instead of this one. Am I being too hard on it? Probably. It's still fun. Every sequel is just better, and it's hard for me to ignore that. I know that's not this game's fault, so here it is at 70. 69. Top Gear and Top Gear 2 and Top Gear 3000 are a set of three 3D-esque racing games. What I like most about Top Gear is how you aren't flying off the road every single time you take a sharp turn. I enjoy outrun and pole position, but I can never stay on the freaking road. The Top Gear games dumbed it down for people with tiny brains and slow reflexes such as myself. All three seem to be mostly similar, but the first game has this weird split screen thing going on where even if you're playing one player, you still need to give up half your screen to the CPU. So maybe try two if that bothers you so much, or 3000 if you want to play a more space themed one. Or if you want that, I suppose you could just... 68. F-Zero. Play F-Zero. I still prefer F-Zero to Top Gear, even if it doesn't have any multiplayer. I think it all comes down to the music and theming. Top Gear is pretty good music in its own right, but there's no Big Blue, there's no Mute City, there's no Silence. F-Zero was a launch game, meaning it came out with the system, and it's mostly a showpiece for that fancy graphical effect the Super Nintendo is famous for. You know, say it with me. Mode 7. It's kind of brutal, too. If you go out of bounds in F-Zero, you freaking die. Then that's it. Game over. Try again from the beginning. 67. Super Off-Road is an NES port. Yay! Out of all the racing games I've listed so far, I can't help but enjoy this stupid mid-80s arcade turned NES turned SNES game the most. It doesn't have any of that fancy Mode 7 3D stuff but it has the most timeless design. Overhead, the whole racetrack visible all at once. This is not to be confused with Super Off-Road The Baja, because that is a Mode 7 3D wank fest and it sucks as a result. This style in basic Super Off-Road is timeless. It was retro at the time, and as a result, when you go back to it, still fun to goof around with even now. 66. Tecmo Super Bowl is one of the best sports video games of all time, not just on the Super Nintendo. Now, do I really think that little of sports games to put one of the greatest of all time so low on my list, only a third of the way up? That's not the case at all. It's just another title which loses points for being a port of an NES game. The rosters are updated here, but other than that, it's a straight port job. Not that that's a bad thing, as both Tecmo Super Bowl 2 and 3 would prove. I think the sequels are both fine games on their own, but they're too slow, especially compared to the original. They add features such as creating custom players, and the graphics are technically more impressive, but neither game is as tight or concise. Eight plays feels like the perfect amount to select from at a time, and that's really the heart of the issue with 2 and 3. They get more into the minutia of football simulation, and lost sight of what made the original so fun. Hence why the first game, aka the NES port, occupies this 66th slot and not two or three. 65, Dragon Quest Three. Maybe I'll put it out to coincide with that fancy remake coming out soon. How is that remake still not out yet? Square Enix hasn't even mentioned it since then. Dragon Quest III, like the last couple games, would be much higher, but same logic holds. It loses major points for being an NES remake. They added this personality quiz, which is fun, I guess. Still, this is a titan of the genre, a pioneering RPG whose legacy extends beyond itself. Dragon Quest III deserves a spot somewhere. Rest assured, this will get the full quote-unquote review treatment eventually. And I stand by that, I'll probably still end up doing this eventually. There's only so many Super Nintendo RPGs, and if I keep doing that show, then in theory, I would have to do this, right? 64. Kirby Superstar. 
Hey, flame guy here. Jason held me at gunpoint and forced me to talk about Kirby Superstore for three minutes, but I already talked about the game for 25 minutes straight, so for your convenience, here's the fast version. What the heck was that? Flame guy, you rapscallion, I'll get you for this! Ow. <laughs> Kirby Superstar is a tad overrated. Many people consider this to be the greatest Kirby game ever made in the whole franchise, not just on the Super Nintendo. I obviously still like the game, it wouldn't have made this list otherwise, but it feels like a jack of all trades, master of none. If you don't know the gimmick, it's marketed as six games in one, and what you get amounts to a full meal of appetizers. The more traditional platformer segments are only a few stages long, one of which is just a remake of the original Kirby's Dream Land on Game Boy. Quick Draw is a fun distraction, Megaton Punch is nothing, the Great Cave Offensive is not fun, I enjoy Gourmet Race, but this is a concept only deep enough to squeeze one stage out of in a traditionally structured game. Not any kind of standalone experiments. You do Gourmet Race one time, it lasts five minutes, and then you're done. Revenge of Meta Knight is awesome, but again, it's too short. Superstar leaves me asking, where's the beef? I'm into what's here, but I'll take a more traditionally structured game anytime. 63. Battletoads and Double Dragon is more of a Battletoads game than a Double Dragon one, though it still has side-scrolling Double Dragon-esque stages, so I'm told. Even if I wasn't lazy as hell and were willing to play past the first few stages of any of these lower entries, I'm probably not good enough to show you anyway. I strongly dislike how they swapped the buttons where B attacks and Y jumps, when in 99% of games this would be the other way around and there's no option to change it either. Oh well, I mean, you get used to it quickly, and there's no sense of complaining about something you'd adjust to in 30 seconds, right? So why did I even bring it up then? I mean, I don't know, man. Why do they do it that way? Why did I even put this game on the stupid list? I guess because I respect the first game, and this is more of the same thing. Fucking nobody cares about freaking Battletoads and Double Dragon anyway. Like, whatever. This is already... It's already past my target word count, let's, let's move on. 62, Radical Dreamers, is the visual novel sequel to Chrono Trigger, sort of. It doesn't really have much to do with the original game, it's just kind of a thing which takes place in the same world. And it's more interesting when viewed as a companion to Chrono Cross on the PS1 than Chrono Trigger. Acting is sort of an alternate universe take on a series of events which happen in Cross. Coincidentally, Cross is also a game about alternate dimensions mentions so it fits into that motif as well. You play as a trio of thieves attempting to pilfer the frozen flame from Viper Manor, an object in place which do not exist in Trigger, but were reused in Cross. It's part romance novel, part choose your own adventure book, part basic puzzle solvery mid-90s point and click game. It's worth bringing up that this was not a traditional cartridge release, but instead was a Satellaview game. If you don't know what the Satellaview was, it was a modem which was only released in Japan, which allowed you to download games to play on your Super Nintendo. Think of it as the Japanese equivalent to the Sega Channel or the Intellivision Play Cable, only with more satellites involved. It's a pretty neat piece of tech, especially for the time, but there weren't that many exclusive games for the thing, BS Zelda probably being the most famous if it isn't Radical Dreamers, and this is the only Satellaview exclusive on the list. It was an interesting footnote and worth bringing up when Whenever you discuss the Super Nintendo library as a whole. 61. Street Fighter 2. All of them. From niche obscure tech hosting a visual novel to one of the most popular and revolutionary games of all time. I'm not going to split hairs with which version makes this list. If you've got Street Fighter 2, or Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, or Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting, or Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, which actually didn't even come out on the Super Nintendo, that was the one on Sega. You've also got Street Fighter Alpha 2, which I'm aware is a completely different game, as well as Street Fighter EX plus A, which might be a ROM hack that I happen to have downloaded on accident. I'm not even sure. 
Actually, wait a second. This Hadouken isn't even blue. This can't be official. So anyway, Street Fighter 2 was huge. One of the most influential games ever made, but that's the original arcade. The Super Nintendo versions are still fun, but I can't give them full marks for its arcade counterpart. This is a Super Nintendo list, not a greatest games of all time list. So 61 for the Super Nintendo versions, more than fair. 60. Cybernator. Cybernator is a lot like Metal Warriors if you've ever played that. Or actually, this is probably less obscure. I'm not sure why I drew that comparison. But they're cousins regardless. Both Konami, super mech, side-scrolling, platformery shooters. Each stage has its own differing objective. It mixes itself up with these shmup-like ones. Sometimes you're in these low-gravity environments where you can essentially float wherever you want. The aiming is a little strange. Definitely something you need to adjust to. But you can lock your gun in place with L, which helps quite a bit. I don't like this one nearly as much as Metal Warriors, spoilers, that's coming up later, but if you're collecting physical Super Nintendo games, Cybernator is a much cheaper alternative that's about 90% as good. 59. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Eye of the Beholder Genuinely impressed me when I reviewed it a couple of years ago. I expected Dungeon Master, a slow mess which feels like it might actually melt your Super Nintendo. This is a first person dungeon crawler with action based combat, but it moves at a lightning quick pace. It's got all the map making, light puzzle solving, goodness you'd expect from an old dungeon crawler. I'm not sure if Eye of the Beholder is good on its own merits or if it just looks like a masterpiece when placed up to the Super Nintendo version of Dungeon Master. Also, I'm just gonna squeeze this in. First person dungeon crawlers have to be the nerdiest genre of any video game. 58, Castlevania Dracula X. Is that seriously what he just sent me? Fuck it. Guess I'll use it. I think what my friend was attempting to say is that despite its baggage, Dracula X is still a pretty cool game. It just suffers by comparison because every other 16-bit era Castlevania was so strong. It's universally considered the worst out of Bloodlines, Rondo of Blood, and 4, and rightfully so. But it's still a Castlevania game made by Konami at the height of their powers. And if you can view it in a vacuum, it's still a fun time. 57. Shadow Run. Shadowrun is not to be confused with the Genesis game of the same title, because they are entirely different beasts. It's a bit clunky, maybe a little intimidating. Anytime you're primarily controlling a mouse cursor with a D-pad, the gameplay is gonna be a little awkward. But it's still a neat little adventure RPG that I actually have a personal history with, because my Shadowrun review was probably the most influential on which path I would end up taking as a YouTuber. I've been doing this channel since 2015, and for the first five years, well, my videos were complete trash for one, so don't take this as me complaining, but I had a bit of an identity crisis. I was doing these instructional videos called You Can Beat, which were exactly what they sound like. Since then, someone has actually taken that name and concept and ran with it. Godspeed, he's done a much better job than I ever did. I didn't enjoy making those. I got into YouTube to review games, to talk about my opinions on games, but these instructional videos were the only ones that anybody watched. I would post a you can beat and it would get a couple hundred views. Then I would follow it up with a review and it would get like 20. I knew that I needed a new channel identity that I needed to niche down as they say and pivot away from doing these you can beat videos. So I posted a review of Shadowrun for the Super Nintendo and it got over a thousand views in one day which was a huge deal for me at the time. I had never had a review of mine reach a thousand views let alone one do it in a day. So in an effort to capitalize, I decided then and there that my new channel identity was going to be the guy who reviews every single Super Nintendo RPG. I enjoyed making that Shadowrun review so much and it did so well so quickly that I figured I should do it again. 
and again and again and again and again and again so i sat down made a list of about 50 rpgs on the super nintendo that i wanted to cover there's wiggle room in the definition of course and the scope of the project has expanded greatly since then to the point where i could go well over 100 if i wanted anyway shadow run was the catalyst for all of this without shadow run i would not be talking to you right now and hell i might not even be doing youtube anymore I mean, I probably would, but it wouldn't look like this. Whether that's a good or bad thing is up for debate, but shit, right now I'm glad it happened. 56. Kirby's Dreamland 3. Is it controversial to put Dreamland 3 above Superstar? I think that's a mildly hot take in the Kirby community. But I'm right, and everybody else is wrong. Look at my shirt. You know a guy wearing this shirt knows what he's talking about. With that being said, I played Dreamland 3 for the first time ever in the making of this video. It came out late in the Super Nintendo's lifespan, so it just kind of gets forgotten by the retro gaming community at large. It's fucking expensive if you want to buy a real cartridge, and by the time this came out, everyone had already made up their mind that Superstar was the definitive Kirby game for the platform. But look at Dreamland. Look at it. It's gorgeous. Look at how these characters' facial expressions change when I do or do not pick them. I appreciate the more focused approach a traditionally structured platformer provides than the grab bag of weirdness we got in Superstar. Props to them for trying, but I don't feel like I'm getting a full game there, whereas here you most certainly are. Oh yeah, and you get to be back cuddled by a giant hamster the whole game. End of argument. Dreamland 3 is the best Kirby game on Super Nintendo. Except for the two other Kirby games, which are higher up on the list, of course. 55. Sparkster. Is a game where if you didn't know any better, you might think that it's another Kirby-like. A cutesy platformer, a cute former as they're known. But it's actually the follow-up to a Sega Genesis game called Doki Doki Panic. This was Konami's attempt at a mascot platformer, and they made a few pretty good games with the character, but it never really caught on in that way. The game itself is fun, it's fast-paced, you have a jetpack which allows you to zoom around the screen, sort of like Sonic's Spin Dash, and then it allows you to gain a ton of momentum from a standstill super fast, so you can be constantly moving, and that's always a good thing in these games. 54. Breath of Fire was the first RPG I ever beat. Without this game, I would not be speaking to you right now. It's the exemplary of a basic turn-based JRPG. It doesn't do anything revolutionary, but it's Capcom, and they knew how to put out a well-polished product regardless of genre. You can tell it was their first attempt at an RPG because design-wise it plays everything safe, but it has a certain charm and character to it. Sometimes simple hits the spot. It's easy too, you don't have to grind very much, and it completely breaks itself with late game abilities. The original Breath of Fire is an incredibly snackable RPG where you can pick it up, then turn your brain off and bash some monsters. 53. Yeast 3 Wanders from Yeast is a bit of an odd duck, a side-scrolling, stage-based RPG. It was ported everywhere. NES, Genesis, various computers, the Turbo Graphics, but the Super Nintendo version, now I haven't played all of them, mind you, but I will say the Super Nintendo version at least looks the best. Game has a charm to it that I can't entirely put words on. The whole thing takes place in this one town in the surrounding areas, and you start to feel a camaraderie with its peoples. East 3 these days is seen as the black sheep of the series, if you will. So much so that Falcom actually replaced it in the series canon with an entirely different game in 2005. 52. Pocky and Rocky. This game is awesome. Hi, I'm Jordan Rezin, and if you're listening to my voice, that means you've made it to number 52 on Jason Graves' list of the top 100 Super Nintendo games. It's time for a tale. The year of 1986 saw the release of three major Japanese games based on their own folklore. In April, from the minds behind Zelda, came the mysterious Murasame Castle. In May, the first in what would become Konami's illustrious Goemon series. Then, a whole four months later, came Taito, bumbling in late to the party with a game called Mysterious Ghost World. It's visually impressive for the era, I guess it pioneered the Shrine Maiden shmup, but uh, I'd easily call it the weakest of the three. 
It's after top-down run-and-gun action, but comes off as slow, strict, and unsatisfying. If you were to ask me which two of these games would receive the Super Nintendo treatment, Ghost World wouldn't have stood a chance. And yet... Developer Natsume knew what they had in Taito's scraggly first draft, playing to the strengths of its art direction and injecting it with a shot of adrenaline. It stays true to Ghost World's focus on heavy, committed movement, but takes it a step further. A slide can get you out of danger, but leaves you hopelessly vulnerable. Indecisively swapping between the fire and spread shots will prevent them from upgrading, so stick to your guns. You can no longer move while waving your wand, so deflection can't be abused. It's more shmup-like, more whimsical, even more specifically Japanese than the first, with a story about western spirits invading the mines and lands of yokai. If the game's arcade difficulty and aesthetic didn't prevent an international localization, you'd think maybe this would. But that was nothing a good American paint job couldn't fix. Sayo and Manuke became Pocky and Rocky, the yokai became no Pino goblins? Slap on some worse box art and the rest is history. Pocky and Rocky isn't often thought of as a tentpole in the console's legacy, but the trajectory of the series is as SNES as they come. Its sequel veered directly into the RPG and adventure tropes that earned the SNES its reputation, with NPCs, shops, branching paths, throwable partners with special abilities, save passwords, and while I prefer its more tightly designed predecessor, two belongs on this machine. That Pocky and Rocky was reimagined yet again just last year by the very same team only makes it SNESer. And dear god, just look at it. With almost 30 years of hindsight, Reshrined might just be the best of the four. And no, Becky does not count. 51. Secret of Mana is a game I have dodged reviewing for years. Well, I'm kind of forced to talk about it now, at least a little bit. First off, beautiful sound and graphics, nobody would dispute that. Three player, simultaneous co-op, which is something you rarely saw in any Super Nintendo game, let alone in an RPG. Real-time action combat, it's a lot closer to A Link to the Past than it is Final Fantasy. It's non-linear, so you can do objectives in a variety of ways. This is one of those games which I think was so overrated for a time that it's starting to circle back around into being underrated. What do you think? Is 51 too high? Too low? Just right? Hello! I hope you're enjoying the video as much as I'm enjoying making it. From here on out, we're leveling up. We're going from tier A games to tier B games, or tier 1 games, tier 2 games, going up a letter grade from C to B. Whatever idiom you want to use. But that last entry on Secret of Mana raised a point that I want to expound upon, and that is games that will not be on the list, such as this beautiful one right here, Tales of Fantasia. It's not on the list because I have never played it. I would say the biggest blind spot that I'm worried about in regards to this list that I might have to update later is Japanese exclusive RPGs because with other genres like baseball, I never played any baseball games on the Super Nintendo and I feel confident after firing all of them up, playing one hour, one hour, one inning batting and one inning pitching. I think I'm good. I think I know what my favorite baseball game is. Same thing with shmups. You load them up, you play until you're out of lives, and I'm pretty confident in my assessment of those games. Platformers, similar. You can get the gist of it pretty quickly. But RPGs, you really can't do that. You need to actually like sit down and have those games digest. So all of those exclusive Japanese ones such as Tales of Fantasia, which I'm sure is a wonderful game, and I'm sure it deserves to be on the list. Star Ocean, I'm sure, is an amazing game. I'm sure it deserves to be on the list. Seiken Densetsu 3. Shit, I grabbed two. That's the one I just had on the list. Three, I'm sure it's an amazing game. Not on the list because I've never played it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that offends you. Anyway, back to the list. 50. Plot. You have to stick with Plock for a few stages before it gets good. First impressions, it looks like a cheaply made, low-budget platformer cash grab, but it's surprisingly fun. Plock is basically Rayman before Rayman. He throws his detached limbs, even his legs. Look, when they're away, Plock drops down because he doesn't have anything to stand on, and when he moves, he hops around. Such a cute touch. Can't talk about Plock without talking about the fantastic music, of course. 
and this is just a solid game. You could do much worse as far as random no-name platformers go, that's for sure. 49, Mickey Mania, is probably inferior to the Sega Genesis edition, but I'm a big enough fan of this to rank it in the top half regardless. Much like its cousin Toy Story, the level variety is what really sold me. They're both Traveler's Tales games too. Shout out to Game Hut, the former Traveler's Tales developer who speaks about all sorts of games that they did. Mickey Mania is based all around his classic pre-television era shorts. I love how as the first stage progresses, it slowly goes from black and white to one at a time, slowly adding colors to its palettes until you're in full color. The game is shockingly difficult. As a kid, I don't think I ever saw past the mad scientist level. This elevator stage can kiss my ass. Of course, my little kid brain wasn't gonna get past this. It's pure memorize the bone pattern. 48. The Illusion of Gaia is a fairly well-known second-tier RPG for the Super Nintendo. And yeah, second-tier sounds about right in all regards. The action is fun, if a little shallow. Its dungeon designs are questionable sometimes, but it's a very cool game. It's a story containing slavery, cannibalism, and social commentary about how everything isn't always what it seems and how prosperous society was built on the backs of some pretty painful stuff. Nintendo published and pushed this thing themselves, at least in America, but it was developed by Quintet and published by Enix elsewhere, which isn't the first or last time you'll be hearing about them. Quintet was known for making this exact type of game. 47. Brain Lord is the illusion of Gaia's more action-centric, more Zelda dungeon-y cousin. This is a case of me rewarding execution over ambition, whereas 9 out of 10 times, I probably swing the other way. I like Illusion of Gaia, but it doesn't quite land the plane, if you know what I mean. Whereas Brain Lord is 100% exactly what it wanted to be. Plus, for some reason, I really enjoy the visual style of both Brain Lord and the Seventh Saga. They were both made by the same people, and while not technically impressive, if anything, they look a little basic, but they're homely. Charming, even. It is the same small-town camaraderie that I complimented in Yeast 3. It's compact compared to Zelda, not a large overworld, but the focus on dungeon design shines through, and that's why it's one spot above the illusion of Gaia. They were both Enix games in most of the world, which were released one month apart. They're two sides of the same coin, each game containing what the other lacks. 46. Sky Blazer is sort of like the Super Nintendo equivalent to Ninja Gaiden. You don't slash with a sword, but your punch is effectively the same thing. You have wall jumps, your sprite is relatively the same size on screen. You just have to ignore that the Ninja Gaiden trilogy exists for that to be true. Not to be confused with Soul Blazer, the quintet developed action RPG, which will not be appearing on this list because I am the internet leading hater of that game. But Sky Blazer, on the other hand, is pretty good. It's one of those games I wanted to keep playing while getting footage, but I have other things to get to. At least until I got to this awkward auto-scrolling flying stage. What the hell were they thinking with this? 45. Goof Troop. Other games to get to, such as this one. If you know about Goof Troop, then you know. I was introduced to it through the Game Grumps of all places, when they played it way back in the JonTron era. One of the best co-op multiplayer games on the system. You don't get many two-player co-op puzzle games. The only other one I can even think of is Portal 2, which obviously isn't on the Super Nintendo. Capcom wasn't messing around with their Disney games. I'm not sure how to describe this one if you've never played it. Maybe a more action-focused co-op Adventures of Lolo? Goof Troop is the perfect father-son game. Not too intense, something you can work together figuring stuff out. It's kind of lame if you play by yourself, but try it out anyway. 44, Tokimeki Memorial is the largest poser pick to make the list because I have never really played it. I have, however, like everyone else, watched the six hour Tim Rogers action button review. And sure, why not throw in the game which basically invented the entire dating sim genre. I enjoyed 10 dates for modern consoles after all, so why not draw these lines all the way back to Tokimeki Memorial? It's a game where you're in Japan, you're in high school, and the only thing you need to worry about is dating girls. And if you're like me and you wasted your high school years playing the Super Nintendo and not dating girls, then something like this has a certain appeal. 43. The Ninja Warriors 
Normally, slowly walking to the right in a game where your sprite takes up this much of the screen is a red flag, but the Ninja Warriors is somehow not shitty despite that. This game is also on Sega CD, and while that version has superior music, it's much worse as an actual game. Seriously, the Sega CD soundtrack to this game is unreal. I have a question to all and any of you out there who partake in those mods which allow CD quality music to be inserted into your Super Nintendo games. If you've never heard of this phenomenon, believe me, it's a real thing. Thing. You can even put these ROMs in your EverDrives and they'll work on real hardware. Anyway, does one of those mods exist for the Ninja Warriors? Oh, it's actually, it looks like it does. That's awesome. So yeah, just emulate that version because you want that other soundtrack. 42, Yeast 4, Mask of the Sun. Was Bump Combat's last stand? What is Bump Combat, you ask? Well, it's kind of extraordinarily stupid, so there's no wonder why it died out. Think Hyde Lied on the NES. That's probably the most famous example, where instead of swinging a sword or hitting a button to attack, you know, like in every other game ever made, three out of the first four Yeast games used a method of attack where all you do is ram into the enemies. No button press, no animation, you just walk into people to fight them. It's a quaint system, and it's a joy to see it in an otherwise very friendly and modern feeling touch. If this were released in America, which it wasn't, I think it would have done really well. As a Zelda alternative, that is. It's 90% there. Of course, because Falcom loved to overcomplicate Yeast to the point of absurdity, they released another Yeast 4 later this same year. Not a port, mind you, a completely different game on the Turbo Graphics, also called Yeast 4, with a different subtitle, The Dawn of Yeast. How can Dawn of Yeast be Yeast 4? when Mask of the Sun already was. Who knows? Then in 2012, because Falcom will Falcom, they went another bridge further. Just like with Yeast 3, they replaced four in its own canon, both versions of four, with memories of Celsetta. If any series is begging for an AVGN knockoff to do a chronically confused video, it's Yeast. 41. Aladdin. Completely different from the more famous Genesis game. The Super Nintendo Aladdin was made by Capcom, so before even playing, you know that it probably won't suck. It's more deliberate than the Sega counterpart. There's no sword. Apples are more effective than they were in the other game. And they need to be more thoughtfully rationed. I always wondered why they didn't use songs from the movie. Maybe they were trying to separate themselves from the Genesis game as much as possible. But enough comparisons. This is still a worthwhile platformer. It controls and handles better than most. There's decent stage variety with a heavy emphasis on grabbing, climbing, and swinging on things. It's fairly easy too. Good one to sit down and plow through in an evening. 40. Live Alive was a victim of expectations for me. And as a result, my review probably came off as a little too harsh. Because before having played it, from reputation, by virtue of this being the Squaresoft game made in between Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger, plus it having the forbidden fruit appeal of being a Japanese-only game, my expectations were through the roof. Then when I finally played it, the game was just a collection of largely unrelated experiments. Like these were concepts Square had kicking around that didn't warrant their own game, so they're of wildly varying quality. And I was disappointed in the final chapters, which were supposed to bring everything together. It doesn't do a great job in my opinion. But what's great is really great. The whole ninja chapter, the dichotomy between the caveman and future robot vignettes. It's the closest thing to a 2001 A Space Odyssey video game we will ever have. Reflecting back now a year after playing through it, now that my disappointment is healed, I'll admit Live Alive is a pretty damn good game. 39. Gunman's Proof. After a long unskippable cutscene to start. Gunman's Proof dares to ask, what if A Link to the Past was a top-down, move-at-your-own-pace shooter? The term Zelda clone gets thrown around a lot, often too liberally, but look at what you're seeing. How else would you describe this? Not that this is necessarily a bad thing, I'm down for Zelda except you shoot things, and your dad hits you at home. In fact, everyone's kind of brutal towards you. Gunman's Proof is cool as hell. I may circle back to this to do a full review sometime. This came out only in Japan, obviously, which is why most of you have never heard of it. Check it out sometime, it's cool. 38. Ultima, the False Prophet. Ultima is one of the oldest RPG series in existence. 
but it's primarily on PCs. A lot of the early games are also on NES, and both 6 and 7 were ported to the Super Nintendo. 7 was perhaps a little too big for it, but 6, known here as the False Prophet, fits fairly well. Obviously its interface can't touch a keyboard and mouse, Ultima 6 is mostly intact, just with a more cumbersome interface. It's an open world, party based, dialogue heavy RPG about the Avatar attempting to find a peaceful resolution to this holy war going on between gargoyles and humans. There's still plenty of fighting, don't get me wrong, but that's not our main option resolving conflicts. What stood out to me in my review was how in-depth NPC dialogue was. Outside of Earthbound, this has to be my pick for best RPG dialogue on the system. Also, while I'm talking about Ultima, shout out to Runes of Virtue 2. Crafted from the ground up for the SNES, it is a horrific train wreck of a game, but it's so much so that it horseshoes back around into actually being kind of cool. So if you're into so bad, they're sort of good, give Runes of Virtue 2 a look. 37, Super Mario RPG. The last Mario game to come out on the Super Nintendo was also its first foray into the role-playing genre. Combining Final Fantasy elements with the standard Mario formula of all things created the unprecedented triumph Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. This is a fantastic example of a series branching out, trying something new, and totally nailing it. Super Mario RPG isn't perfect, particularly when it comes to game balance, but it's an imaginative adventure all the way through, demonstrating an understanding of the genre's strengths, with effective storytelling and decision making. For the first time, the Mario series presents a believable world that you can actually get into. Towns and NPCs have very entertaining dialogue, becoming the inspiration for the entire Paper Mario series in the future. With such a charming presentation and masterful soundtrack by Yoko Shimomura of Final Fantasy fame, this is a delightful experience, and surprising success at blending two completely different concepts together. Who'd have thought they'd pair so well? Shout out to Gino, Booster, Valentina, and the Axum Rangers. If you like Mario or RPGs, this is totally worth playing today. 36. Shin Megami Tensei. From one extreme to the other, Jord covered perhaps the most beginner-friendly, nicest RPG on the system in Mario RPG, but I'm swinging the pendulum back around with Shin Megami Tensei. One of the most unintuitive, bastardly, high random encounter, plot dense, lore dense games I have ever had the honor of playing. It's kind of a glitchy mess held together by duct tape, but sometimes I happen to enjoy glitchy messes held together by duct tape if the ideas around it are solid. And with Shin Megami Tensei, they all are. This is one of those games where I'm not even sure I can vouch for how good it is, quote unquote, but it's incredibly cool. Is that a running theme with these last games, cool? And I'll take cool over good mostly every time. 35, Wild Guns. It's kind of a wacky one in retrospect. It's a two-plane shooter where you're moving left to right in the foreground while firing at enemies located in the back. It's a cool, there's that word again, western meets steampunk aesthetic, but its largest claim to fame is the co-op multiplayer. It's on Switch, both a fancy remake and the original, so you can play it online. Wild Guns might be a little too advanced for its own good. This was obviously before dual analog, so how can one D-pad control both how you move and where you're aiming at the same time? The answer is it can't. You can only only move when not firing, which is a necessary concession I suppose, but you really feel this type of game's ambitions butting up against the limitations of the system. This was never an arcade game or anything either, it's custom built for the Super Nintendo. Unfortunately, it's also one of those games which are way too expensive to buy physically. Natsume games are kinda like that, they all shot up in value. This and the next game did anyway. 34. Lufia 2 Rise of the Sinistrals. So in my review of this game, I neglected to even mention the Tower of Sacrifice. I messed up, I know, I'm sorry. When I was playing the game, I went in there for about five minutes, said, huh, well that's neat, then left and never thought about it again. If you're not aware, there's an area in Lufia 2 where you restart at level one, and you need to do this big ass dungeon while starting from nothing. It's a lot like Torniko's Mystery Dungeon, which did not make the list. Or to use a more modern example, think Eventide Island on Breath of the Wild. 
wild. It's a fun little extra, but does it make me like Lufia 2 any more or less than I already do? Yeah, maybe a little more. I don't know, it's an incredibly well-crafted, if a little basic, RPG. It has these incredibly Zelda-esque puzzle dungeons, which are more focused on room-to-room -room puzzles rather than an interconnected space like Zelda. Think more block pushy pulley than A Link to the Past, but they're still satisfying to unravel. And Lufia 2 is pretty damn fine game. One of the best on the system. Obviously, its placement of 34 means that I don't think so, but it's still a solid B+, I'd say. 33. Super Bomberman. The whole series. How on earth did Hudson get away with not one, not two, not three, not even four, but five! Five of them! Five Bomberman games on the Super Nintendo. Look, I love Bomberman as much as the next guy, but it isn't a series like Kirby where each game is distinctly something different. If I threw up a split screen right now with all five Bomberman games, who is gonna know the difference? I doubt the people who worked on these games could tell them apart. Mercifully, here in America, they showed some restraint and only brought two of them over, but what the hell, Japan? It's Bomberman. Again, riding on a Triceratops doesn't change the gameplay hardly at all. How was this profitable? Who bought Super Bomberman 1 through 4 and thought, hmm, gee, you know what would really hit the spot? A fifth Bomberman game for my Super Nintendo. Only more in Japanese. They're all huge improvements over the NES games. Four player Bomberman will always be fun. Five players if you're playing three and only three for some reason. As dumbfounded as I am, they managed to squeeze this stone for so much blood. Bomberman is still a genius idea for a game, and comical amount of sequels or not deserves to kick off the top third of this list. 32, Dragon Quest VI. And the number one spot goes to... Dragon Quest VI. Dragon Quest VI is always glossed over in favor of Dragon Quest VII, V, and VIII. And while VIII is probably a better game, it wasn't released on the Super Nintendo, right? Just phones and 3DS and PS2. And just for good measure, I don't even like JRPGs. I, I can't stand them. But I can't stand Dragon Quest VI because it is streamlined to hell. Alright, it doesn't take 100 years for the adventure to actually start. It doesn't take 400 hours before the inciting incident happen, all right? <laughs> Not to mention, you get to meet so many great characters, like this guy, this guy, this chick, and all of these wonderful people who are just rooting for you. What makes this game so great, story-wise, is that you're the chosen one by circumstance, not by fate. Kind of like in Harry Potter, he was the chosen one by the circumstance of Voldemort believing him to be the one who would eventually stop him. And then the prophecy was talking about when he will stop at the end of the last book, not whatever he were to avoid had he killed the baby, but if he did not try to kill the baby, it would never have happened, man. Oh my god, Voldemort fulfilled the prophecy when he tried to avoid the prophecy? <laughs> no, but for real seas dudes, DQ6 is actually really good. As someone who doesn't like JRPGs, I'll say this much, it's the first JRPG I've been compelled to ever finish without any external motivation. It has such a great appeal to it that you want to go into it mm -hmm. blind, I promise you. In terms of the combat, it makes more sense to me than most other JRPGs I've tried. Sure, it's not as refined as Chrono Trigger, but fuck. Chrono Trigger ain't even turn-based, you normie. You sure have a lot more going for it in being so simple than any game with whatever complicated bullshit you have to deal with over there. If anything, I said Dragon Quest VI has more mainstream appeal because it has the basics as hard-coded into it as it does. Its simplicity makes the story take the front seat, and worst case Ontario, you'll be grinding for some levels, but nothing that requires grinding for an extended period of time. You can actually strategize a bit past the next road bump without things like save states or sheet codes. Some may say that, well, DQ6 is the most basic one, but that's not a bad thing. In fact, it's the best thing because they went back to it after 7, because 7 had too much busy work before anything actually happened. And then they realized that, well, this is better. Straightforward, no bullshit, you're showing someone, and this is why. 
You have no idea how relieving it is to actually get to know why I'm the show someone before the game's over. Whoa, motivation for the player? Heck yeah, dude. But yeah, this is pretty much Dragon Quest VI. And even though I should have done Goof Troop, I don't regret doing Dragon Quest VI. Let's just put it like this. It is perhaps the perfect JRPG for people who don't like JRPGs. Anyways, remember fellas, never trust a man with no shirt on. The Final Fight Trilogy are the most famous beat-em-ups on the Super Nintendo. These are games where you play as the mayor of a city, handing down some street justice. There's a lot of wrestling references, pile drivers, back-to-back -back suplexes, Hollywood, Sid, Jake, Billy, Andor, like Andre? Close enough. Hold on, wait a second, Hollywood can't be a reference. In fact, most of these can't. Most of these wrestlers didn't even exist yet, or if they did, they went on to be different names. Iconic game over screen. You can also play as some other jabronis. This is even a completely separate release called Final Fight Guy, which is just Final Fight with some guy named Guy. Look, it's Chun-Li, or Chun-Li. Capcom made Final Fights. You know it's good. Can you tell I'm stretching for things to say? You walk to the right, you beat people up. Good times were had by all. Except for the people getting beat up, I guess. Two is my favorite, but I have no idea what the consensus best Final Fight is. What's your favorite? Let me know in the comments, I guess. Whatever, next game. 30, Sim City. Nintendo themselves made this port of SimCity. It's a legendary PC game, but they did a great job of casualizing or Nintendo-ifying what could have been an unwieldy translation. Case in point, any of the other Sim games which came to the SNES, such as SimCity 2000, which is way too complicated to be fun in this environment. You either think planning your own city sounds fun or you don't. There's not really an in-between. I've played this a million times. I had it on Wii Virtual Console. And it might have been my most played VC game. It's endless. You can just keep building cities forever. When you get bored with one, just start a new one. There are also predetermined scenarios which you can choose to do as well. For example, taking over Detroit and attempting to unshithole the place. Yeah, I know. Impossible task. But in SimCity for Super Nintendo, you could actually make Detroit tolerable. And I challenge you to find any other reality where that's possible. 29. Shin Megami Tensei 2. Like its predecessor was never released in America, and it's even more of a bastard to play, believe it or not. But at the same time, it's hugely influential. It might have been the best pound for pound story of any Super Nintendo game. And that's not something I say lightly. These old Shin Megami Tensei games are hugely impressive for their constant bombardment of new things happening plot-wise. 2 here is about unraveling how this new society post-apocalypse Tokyo functions. It has the whole amnesiac protagonist thing going on as well, but unlike most of the time this trope is employed, in this instance it pays off well in ways that actually make sense. It's the life-old JRPG trope where you eventually take on God himself, but more so than in any other game, again, it actually makes sense here. SMT2 is begging for some kind of remake or remaster. It's time, Atlas. We need official English versions of 1 and 2, even if that just means translating and jumping the ROM onto Switch Online. They're both on the Japanese service. Preferably some kind of Sega Ages-like remaster would be the route they'd go. Shoot, Sega owns Shin Megami Tensei now. They could be actual Sega Ages if they wanted to be. 28. Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. It's impossible to talk about the top 100 Super Nintendo games without bringing up Yoshi's Island, and since my buddy Jason here wasn't going to do it, I guess I have no choice but to take the reins for a quick sec here. Yoshi's Island, as its friends call it, but its full legal name is Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. This game is a direct sequel to the 1991 hit platformer if you don't consider the main character, location, gameplay, or placement on the Mario timeline. What happened directly after Mario 64? 
Next question. To me and many others, Yoshi's Island is one of the greatest games on the Super Nintendo, and honestly holds up as one of the best 2D platformers ever made. A bold claim, I realise, but if you've played this game for any amount of time, you get it. The gameplay on offer is super unique. You get to eat enemies with Yoshi's stretch Armstrong ass tongue, and swallowing them turns them into eggs which can be used as projectiles to attack and defeat other foe, or interact with the level in some way. And this isn't just some throwaway mechanic, there's a ton of application for this. There are question mark clouds you can hit that can fundamentally alter the terrain of a level, there are breakable walls that you can mould into a stairway or a corridor, and a ton of other unique ways the levels can be affected by Yoshi's unborn children. Each of the game's levels play with this mechanic to varying degrees, and they all feature some of the best level design I've ever seen in a platformer. Each level has an individual identity, whether that be thematically or through the gimmicks at play throughout, and they were all really enjoyable. There was never a level that I came out of thinking, God, that was horrible. At worst, they were just kind of unremarkable, but never straight up bad. In my opinion. And if you want to track me down and tell me how much you disagree with me, don't. And of course, we couldn't talk about how great Yoshi's Island is without mentioning that damn visual style. It goes for something of a crayon, storybook sort of thing, which seems like it would be difficult to pull off with only 16 bits to work with, but in my opinion, it manages, and it does it really well. It's just so appealing to look at. The bold outlines on everything, the vibrant, beautiful colours, the way the characters are designed and animated, it is an absolute treat for the eyes, much like how the soundtrack is a treat for the ears. The songs in this game have such a playful feel to them, both in terms of the instrumentation and the actual melody, which fits right in with the colouring book style of the game. So when you combine this audio-visual feast with the absolutely immaculate gameplay, you've got a game that'll go down in history of one of the greatest on its platform. The game has such a flow and rhythm to its gameplay, the tight and snappy controls become second nature and absorb you in this downright artful adventure. Yoshi's Island is perfect. <coughs> Almost perfect. 27. Sunset Riders is a Contra clone set in the Wild West. Do I really need to say anything else? Look at this guy. You kill him and he says, Bury me with my money. Bury me with my money. Iconic. This game is tough as hell, which is why I always pick Bob or Commando, because they start with the Contra shotgun spreader. Upgrades then let you dual wield. You have to learn how to move, when to shoot, when to hold them, when to fold them, when to slide between bullets. I prefer this a little over Wild Guns, you remember from eight slots ago. It's more traditionally side-scrolly, but you can't go wrong with either. They're both multiplayer too, which makes everything better always. It's pretty short, but I've still never beaten this. Someday I will. If not, then bury me with my money, I guess. 26. Kirby's Avalanche has gone by many names. Poyo Poyo, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, but Kirby's Avalanche is how I first played it, and it's still my favorite incarnation of the series. Everyone has their puzzle game, and call me basic, but mine is... Tetris. Still tons of fond memories playing Avalanche though. I got good enough at this to the point where none of my friends ever wanted to play with me because they'd never win. You know Sonic Mania's Puyo Puyo boss fight? That segment blew my mind, but it was over in like 10 seconds because they made it stupid easy. Then I go online and people were complaining about getting stuck there. And I'm over here thinking, shit, Bronto Burt and Kirby's Avalanche was tougher than Eggman and Sonic Mania. The game itself is about matching four of the same color, attempting to get as large a combo as possible before your stack reaches the top. There's a multiplayer element where you send garbage bits back and forth, and it's just good clean fun. You add Kirby's music and presentation to this, and you've got an addicting combo. <laughs> 25. Act Razor. I've spoken about Act Razor a million times, but never actually done a review. It's part city builder, part side scrolling platformer action, part god simulator. Each of these elements aren't necessarily as fleshed out as they could have been or would have been had the focus been on any one of these three things, but together they mesh to create something wholly unique. There's never been another game quite like Act Razor, except for, I guess, Act Razor Renaissance. 
anyone remember this? It just kind of came and went. But a few years ago, ActRaiser actually got a full HD remake that I and presumably nobody else ever played. It was the beneficiary of being an incredibly early SNES game, coming out less than a month after the system itself. So it stood out, especially when there were only a few games to choose from. It has fantastic music, presentation, and theming. The whole role-playing as God aspect also leads to some unexpectedly poignant moments. You're guiding a civilization, and that's just an incredibly cool feeling that you really don't get anywhere else on the Super Nintendo. Hello everybody, me again, and in that Ultima entry, I talked about games that are so bad they're good, such as Runes of Virtue 2 here, and I wanted to give a bit of a shout out to some other games that I believe also fall into that camp. That or they're just interesting in some other way. We've got Lagoon here, which is another similar to Ultima Runes of Virtue 2. It's a horribly made RPG that is just the biggest piece of shit you'll ever play. But it kind of circles around back to actually being fun because you feel like you're getting over something. We've also got The Lawnmower Man, which I have no idea if this falls into the camp. I just think the graphics are really cool and I wanted to bring it up somewhere in this video. And lastly, another game I just think is really cool. Uh, Faceball 2000, which is a first-person shooter with smiley faces, and was actually adapted from a Game Boy game. Yeah, I guess I only really have two actual So Bad They're Good picks, but they're both pretty decent. And I think uh, Super Bob Hoskins Bros with Equinox, I think he has a similar feeling towards that game as well, so that's a third So Bad It's Kinda Good game. Anyway, back to the last 24 entries of the list. 24. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time is by far the most amount of fun I've ever had playing a beat-em-up. Most games of this genre fall into similar traps, mostly just that they overstay their welcome. These are repetitive games by nature, and they burn themselves out by the time you get to 20 or 30 minutes in. Even the new Turtles game, Shredder's Revenge, which was excellent, I still felt fatigued well before the game was over, and it just made me want to play Turtles in Time again. Specifically this super Super Nintendo version too. It flows much better than the arcade. This is the kind of thing I could run through any day of the week, never get bored, and I don't even care about the Ninja Turtles. I didn't watch the show growing up or anything, and 90% of what I know about the franchise comes from this game. Not sure I can articulate exactly why this one doesn't get boring to me, which every other beat-em-up eventually does, but I can give it a shot. Turtles in Time does a great job with level variety. Each stage has a distinct setting, and they also throw in a few auto-scrolling vehicle-esque stages here and there to mix it up. Neon Knight Riders in particular I've always loved. Your moveset is small, but everything you have is useful in some way. I think something like Shredder's Revenge is an example where they give you so many moves that you don't end up using most of them. Whereas the only worthless ability in Turtles in Time is the one that costs you your own health to attack. On the other extreme, it's not like Golden Axe either, where you basically just need to do a running kick on everyone, or maybe try to land the down thrust if you can. In Turtles in Time, you can't just jump kick everything you see. Basic attacks are still worthwhile. The best attacks, you you know, the ones where you throw your enemies into the foreground, and the one where you smash them back and forth repeatedly, require you to put in some work to accomplish as opposed to hitting a predetermined button combo. And then, to top it all off, timeless music and sound effects. And Turtles in Time is a strong contender for my favorite soundtrack on the entire system. And no, I'm not kidding. 23. Final Fantasy V is the lesser of the Final Fantasy Super Nintendo trilogy, but that's some stiff competition, so there's no shame in being last place in that race. Floor was one of the most influential JRPGs in history, and Six is one of the most acclaimed games of all time. When stood up to those, it's not very remarkable, I'll admit. But on the other hand, it's some people's favorite Final Fantasy game in the whole series. It's the one which gives you by far the most control and amount of options when constructing your party. For some people, that's a big deal. But I'm more the kind of guy who's just happy to go with the flow and take what the game gives me. The story is about a tree that comes to life and is pissed off that humans have been taking such shitty care of the environment. In the end, you and your friends valiantly defend your right to spray aerosol chlorofluorocarbons, burn fossil fuels, and deforest as much land as they please. 22. Final Fantasy 2. 
also continues this environmental theme by spreading positive messages such as when we use up all of our energy on the surface, we can always dig underground for more. If that dries up, we can always rely on the moon crystals. Private airships are also very cool and not a waste of jet fuel at all. In all seriousness, Final Fantasy IV was such a massive leap forward for the JRPG genre in many ways. While the plot itself ends up being, for lack of a better term, stupid, the way that it's told was revolutionary. It managed to use its characters' stats and levels as tools to tell its story as opposed to those being disparate game mechanics gatekeeping how fast a player is able to progress. It was one of the first games to take a screenwriting 101 class because, unlike earlier RPGs which were made up of a series of smaller, often unconnected adventures on your way to achieving one clearly spelled out specific goal from the onset, Final Fantasy IV II plays out more like a serialized TV show where each each episode leads into and builds upon the last. This was Square's first attempt at telling a story in that way, and it shows. Hence why this game is ranked 22 and not number 2. The plot outline they were working off of clearly ended about 3 hours into the game, leaving them to just make shit up as they went along for the rest of the runtime, and it gets dumb really fast. Still, this is a legendary RPG, even if the plot doesn't hold up to any kind of scrutiny if you examine it for more than two seconds. It still dares to try, and I'll reward a game for trying and failing than not even trying at all. 21. Super Castlevania 4. Let me say that again. It's not just Castlevania 4. No, no, no. It's Super Castlevania 4. Honestly, if you made me choose, I'd pick Castlevania 3 before 4 almost every time. But that's not an SNES game, now, is it? The Angry Video Game Nerd back in 2009 did a great job articulating why 4 is great. It's all about control. What this lacks in level design, it makes up for with its 8-directional whip. It feels good to wield the this thing, especially coming from the NES games. The trade-off being, of course, as a result of this newfound power, it's much easier than the other Castlevanias. Whether or not that's good or bad is up for interpretation. This is obviously a fantastic game, but I've always felt the levels were too basic for it to be one of the best Castlevanias, or one of the best games on the Super Nintendo. You have the cool spinning room, which is a neat gimmick, but other than that, a lot of these stages feel like nothing, or like graphical showpieces instead of pieces of design. For example, the famous Mode 7 room where the background spins around like this is possibly the most basic level in Castlevania history. Anyway, cool game, a solid B plus, A minus. 20. Terranigma is the rare European and Japanese release that never came to America, not even on the virtual console or to modern platforms or anything. This is a lost game. Despite that, its reputation has outgrown this setback, with many considering it to be one of the best RPGs on the system, right up there with, you know, Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, Six. and Earthbound. And I guess count me among that camp, maybe a tad lower. It's been a long time since I played through it, so it might actually deserve to be higher with those games, but it needs a refresh in my mind. This is the end of the unofficial Soul Blazer trilogy, with number 48, Illusion of Gaia, being the second entry. And it's fascinating to see the same themes tackled by the same developers three times in a row. Terranigma is certainly the most complete of the three, and heck, you can even say four games with Actraiser thrown into this camp if you want. All were developed by Quintet and published by Enix, each about the rebuilding and examination of human society as a whole. Enigma you start only being able to communicate with plants, then animals, then early humans, then eventually, slowly, you make your way up to modern day, losing touch with each step behind you in between. It plays great too. It's sort of like Secret of Mana without the recharge, and I think this could have been a decent action game if it wanted. It has these huge Zelda-like dungeons too. So yeah, this is a winner. Try it out if you haven't. 19. Metal Warriors is an insane spectacle. Look at these intro cutscenes. They almost look like reanimated Sega CD or early PlayStation FMVs. This is a mech game which does a fantastic job of actually feeling like you're in control of a giant robot. Think of something like Metal Storm. Great NES game, but you die in one hit, and as a result, it's more of a precise, precision, Contra-styled game where you need to be incredibly careful. Metal Warriors is much looser. You're in this mech you should feel like a freaking tank. You should be able to absorb some damage. And you can here. You fly around blowing shit up 
taking gunfire in every direction. Because after all, to you, these little microscopic ant people firing guns, you should be able to just brush them off. Metal Warriors does a great job of making you feel powerful. And you also get a gosh darn laser sword. You can also get out of your mech to pilot other vehicles, and to top it all off, there's a two-player battle mode, which looks like it's tons of fun. Nintendo and Konami, please put this on Switch Online. I need to play this multiplayer online. 18. Super Turrican and Super Turrican 2. Believe it or not, I had not ever played either Turrican before starting this video, and they both instantly impressed me. 18 might even be too low, because I may not have spent enough time with these games. It was around the time I was jumping from Alaskan Sandworm to Worm in Turrican 2 that I knew it was going to end up very high on this list. It's incredibly Contra-esque, reminds me the most of Hardcore on the Genesis, and that they're more set-piece shooters than they are platformery levels. I enjoyed my time with both of these, but if I'm picking a win I'd have to go with two on account of how inventive some of these stages got. But for me, it still doesn't quite top the king of the run and gun. 17. Contra 3 The Alien Wars is the craziest action movie that could never be made. You're riding on missiles, shooting a giant, whatever the hell this is. It's a beefed up Contra, it takes the same concept, same basic controls as the NES and arcade Contra games, and gives them all the fixings of a Super Nintendo upgrade. A stand in place while you shoot button, auto fire when you hold Y down, two weapon slots. Contra 3 handles like a dream. It has all of these insane action set pieces the NES games could only only dream of. I will lament that it relies more on memorization than the originals, that in hindsight it's kind of a half step between those games and hardcore on the Genesis, but Contra 3 is arguably the best balance between those two styles. You'll have two or three boss fights a stage, they're all ridiculous, and Contra 3 is inarguably one of the best action games on the system. 16. Hagane is hard as fuck. That challenge I was complaining about that was lost in Castlevania 4, well I found it, it's in Hagane. This is infamous for being the most expensive game on the system, at least among official non-competition, non-weird gun rifle peripheral, non-I-hope-you-happen-to-have-this-downloaded-on-your-say-tell-of-you releases. It's kind of a shame because the game itself is worth talking about outside of that context. It's kind of like if Shinobi 3 on the Genesis crossed with Batman on NES, and was much more difficult than both of those titles. You have selectable weapon types, a slash, a shot which you can also do straight up, and grenades which travel at an angle. I've never beat this, probably never will, but I want to. And I think that's the sign of a great action game. It might sound stupid, but I really believe that if Hagane had better music, it would be up there with some of the most famous SNES titles at the top or near the top of some people's lists. Music goes a long way in making an impression on the player, and when debating what order Hagane and the game that's coming up next were going to go on this list, the tie went to the game with the better music, the much more famous game with the better music. Hagane's music is inoffensive at the best times, but just downright bad in the worst. 15. Mega Man X, and Mega Man X2, and Mega Man X3. Mega Man X. More like Mega Man Extremely Amazing. Yo, it's Dave from Double Dragon Gaming here, and I am pleased to be talking to you guys about a game I truly love and enjoy, properly placed at number 15 in the Jason Graves Top 100 SNES Countdown! Now, first off, you should know that I'm old as fuck, and very proud to have grown up in the retro games era. As a young lad, I played the shit out of all of the NES Mega Man games, and still do. I enjoy them quite a lot, but I remember being truly impressed with watching his 8-bit to 16-bit evolution onto the SNES. Back in the days, my brother and I didn't physically own many cartridge games, and Mega Man X was one of the few we actually got, knowing full well it was going to be worth having in our small library. Not only did the game look great and play solid, but having his new suit upgrades while also retaining his ability to absorb boss enemy abilities felt like a real improvement over the previous ones on Nintendo. And the new villain of Sigma was a nice new change over Dr. Wily, who genuinely felt like a real threat. And of course, I can't mention X without Zero, who starts out as Mega's superior, but by the end of the game, you become even more powerful than he is. I always thought Zero was such a badass character, 
who wouldn't be available to play as until X3. And speaking of sequel games, Mega Man X2 was pretty much just more of the same, but with the inclusion of the CX4 chip. With that one, they tried using some very basic wireframe graphics and transparency effects. It was extremely mediocre and cheesy even back then. I always thought to myself, what the hell is up with this title screen? So, in my opinion, not only is Mega Man X superior compared to the OG ones, but it was the best of all the X games, with two being more of the same, still good but not quite as great as the first, and the rest getting progressively worse. X looks his best in the first two, and seems to get more wonky looking as the games go on. Look, I could go on forever talking about these games, but I don't want to steal all the time, so I'll have to leave it at that. Knowing Jason fucking Graves, he may not agree with all my points here, but this shit is my segment and I get to say what I want. So I'll leave you with this. Out of all the side-scrolling games on the SNES, this one outshines the majority of them and deserves its spot as the 15th best game made on the SNES. On that, I know we both agree. And uh, psst, check out Double Dragon Gaming on YouTube. <laughs> 14. Breath of Fire 2 is Capcom's last stand. Spoilers, this is the highest Capcom game on the list. Credit to them, they got nine games on the list. 14 if you count the Mega Man X and Street Fighter games as separate entities. I'm an RPG guy, so naturally their best SNES game, as I see it, is Breath of Fire 2. It's a tale about how in the 1600s, the newly unified Japanese government outlawed, then purged their entire country of Catholics primarily, but all Christianity in general, then were forced to open up their country by Americans a couple of hundred years later, and their internal resistances towards that. There's also dragons and a cat girl or something. I don't know, they're not that important. Some might be surprised to see Breath of Fire 2 rank this high because it's kind of an annoying, generic, unfriendly JRPG. But if you watch my channel on the reg, have seen my review of it, then you know that I'm a huge fan. Despite it it not always being fun, it's a game with a lot going on, which it doesn't always get credit for. 13. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. Only number 13 on the list? This is the point where every pick after this, everything's gonna be compared to A Link to the Past. Because this is the first real number one contender domino to fall. A Link to the Past might be the most common top game on a top whatever Super Nintendo games list. I'm going to get comments like, It's not better than A Link to the Past. Seriously, bro? Like, that's gonna be your take? Clay Fighter above Zelda? No, I didn't actually do that. Sorry, Clay Fighter, you didn't make the cut, pun intended. A Link to the Past is an excellent game. It's number 13 on my freaking list, and I like a lot of Super Nintendo games. I enjoy it, but it's never been one of my favorites. This was the game that invented the Zelda formula TM, at least until Breath of the Wild. But it's true, A Link to the Past in many ways was the template they built Zelda games on for over 20 years. You don't put a game that you don't respect as high as 13th on your top 100 Super Nintendo games of all time list. This was uber competitive. I'm sorry, 13th is just where the chips fell. It's a beefed up Zelda 1, streamlines the adventure, makes progression way less cryptic, miraculously still maintains the sense of wonder and endless adventure that game had. It also gives so much of its own, fusing two multiple realities that interact and mirror each other. I love the feeling when you go back to your house in the dark world, only it's not your house anymore. In this universe, some weird creatures moved in and set up shop. A Link to the Past is a classic in every sense of the word, a timeless masterpiece, arguably the best blend of exploration, puzzle solving, and action on the system. I have always respected this game, but despite finishing it three or four times in my life, I've never fallen in love with it. Always thought it was missing something. A certain something that this next entry has. Well, Pac-Man 2, The New Adventures. Fucking <laughs> 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 Pac-Man 2. Oh my god, Pac-Man 2. Pac-Man 2 is the funniest name for a video game 
ever. We have Pac-Man, this timeless arcade classic. And then we have Pac-Man 2, which is, what is this game? Does this mean that I like Pac-Man 2 more than Zelda A Link to the Past? Yes! I force people to play Pac-Man 2 habitually. That's my friendship test. If you want to be my friend, I measure you against Pac-Man 2, the new freaking adventures. Most of the time they think it sucks, and then I never speak to those people ever again. It's one of the most bizarre video games ever made. It's kind of like you're role-playing an overexcited kid watching the 80s Pac-Man cartoon. You don't directly control them, and that's what makes this game so interesting. You, the player, merely make suggestions for Pac-Man to maybe follow if he's in a good enough mood. Sometimes you shoot stuff with your slingshot, sometimes you shout words at the TV. Just simply the fact that they had the balls, they had enough gumption to call whatever the fuck this game is Pac-Man 2. Ignore all of those other games Pac-Man has been in. This right here, what you're looking at, is the true follow-up. The idea that Pac-Man freaking 2 would be an interactive TV watching simulator is one of the funniest jokes in video game history. I love it. And yes, I'm aware it was not called Pac-Man 2 in Japan, which makes it even funnier. Some American marketing executive thought, hmm, how could we sell this weird ass game that's nothing like like anything created before or will ever come after. All right, guys, you, you sitting down? I got it. We're gonna call it Pac-Man 2. Genius! This game rests on its incredibly animated Saturday morning cartoon sprite work. And the animation goes such a long way characterizing Pac-Man. Look at how distraught he is when Miss Pac wants him to do literally anything. Leave the man alone, he just wants to watch TV. My favorite is to be sassy Pac-Man. Just look at this guy, this guy's up to no good. Pac-Man 2 can be annoying, but that's my favorite kind of game. Prickly, annoying, but the personality shines through. The worst thing that a game or any piece of entertainment can be is boring. Not annoying. Annoying can stick with you. You can remember annoying. Remember when Pac-Man tripped on that skateboard 20 times in a row? And you kept saying down, look down you dumbass, you'd shoot it with a slingshot, but Pac-Man was in such a shitty mood he just kept running over the skateboard? Yeah, you can look back on that and laugh when you're done playing. It might be rage inducing in the moment, but it's so funny. You could also play a port of the original Pac-Man and unlock Miss Pac-Man at the arcade. Pac -Man 2 is also on the Genesis, but the Super Nintendo version is the superior one. And yeah, I put it ahead of Zelda. What are you gonna do? It's my list. You can't change it. I can, and I'm not going to. Ha ha ha. 11. Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War is a game that most Fire Emblem fans have not even played because it only came out in Japan and old pre-awakening Fire Emblem games can be fucking torturous at times. This is one of those games where if you played it on SNES 9X and held down the fast forward the entire time, I would not blame you for a second. It is so dang slow. So what separates this not only from other Fire Emblem games, but from any strategy RPG I've ever played? Normally, such as in Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem, which is way up there on this list, when playing these games, I skip all of the dialogue because political drama, straight up, is fucking boring. Almost every Fire Emblem game contains a plot and storyline that is not worth giving a shit about. 9 out of 10 Fire Emblem games, you can skip all the cutscenes and you will miss nothing. Genealogy of the Holy War is that 1 in 10 Fire Emblem games. It did the impossible. It got me to actually pay attention, read, and process each cutscene in a Fire Emblem game. This is the best Fire Emblem story ever. To this day, they're all in Holy War's shadow. It also boasts significantly larger battle maps, which again, to this day, modern Fire Emblem hasn't even tried having maps this big. It's an incredible journey. There's a shocking twist halfway through. It borrows from Hamlet. And to top it all off, at the time, this was the best and most complex combat system they ever had. Now there is one more Fire Emblem game on Super Nintendo, but it didn't make the list only because I've never played it, sorry. So if you're expecting to see that third Fire Emblem game, I apologize. Perhaps I'll update this list after completing my every SNS RPG series, because that's what this list needs. More RPGs, right? 10. 
Final Fantasy III, Six. such as this RPG, an unflappable, undisputed classic, a contender to this day for the best Final Fantasy game. It was both a culmination of what Square had learned from Final Fantasies 1 through 5, and the new direction the series would take for the better part of a decade. Never before had we seen a game attempt to be this cinematic, one which wrote its characters with the same nuance of any novel. It represents the best video game company of the next, that is the PS1 slash N64 generation, coming into their own. Its base is this tripwire act of attempting to juggle all these main characters. It's difficult to pen a story for a few main leads, let alone 14. Sure, in practice, a few of them are taggers on and don't end up mattering that much, but there are seven legitimate claims for who could be the main character of the story, with a few more which are almost as crucial. Then the second half of this game is non-linear, so you have to account for that when you're planning the story as well. Normally you'd be sacrificing a degree of storytelling, giving up control of what order you want events to happen in, but despite making those concessions, it still somehow works in tandem with this world. The first half sets up all these personal fables, all while sticking to the main plot. Then the second half concludes each individual's story Storyline. The first half introduces shit that these characters need to deal with, the second half is the characters dealing with the shit, which is a structure Square would make great use of in a certain game they made later, which is yet to appear on this list. I guess you can glean where I stand on that particular debate then. But Final Fantasy VI is still an all-timer. No, not recommended. Required play for everyone who has ever loved any RPG. Nine. Super Punch-Out. From complex characters to trote ethnic stereotypes, it's everything which made Mike Tyson's Punch-Out great, minus Mike Tyson. And who needs him? It ups the ante, requires more strategery, its puzzle fights are more puzzling, it makes use of a few new mechanics, such as the variable Super Punch. The opposing boxers are all now cheating bastards, doing jump kicks, spitting in your face, throwing balls at you. It's much more cartoony than the NES games, which opens up a a whole new realm of possibilities. Super Punch-Out embodies the super philosophy to a T. It's the same basic game as Punch-Out on the original Nintendo, but superified. Larger, more lively sprites and animations, more complex puzzles and fighter patterns to figure out. It's everything you liked about Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Yeah, I already said all this without the man himself. For that reason, you know, the Mike Tyson thing, it's nowhere near as well remembered and didn't catch on nearly as well as the NES original, but Super Punch-Out is every bit the game the last one and if you've ever enjoyed that then this one's just as worthwhile if not more so it keeps track of your best times adding to its replayability not that i've ever beaten this or any punch out game except the wii because they get impossible towards the end never beaten either bruiser brother or mike tyson in the original for that matter yeah i know fake gamer alert but despite that the punch out series are some of my favorite games and i'll blast through them or blast as far as i can blast any time. 8. Donkey Kong Country and Donkey Kong Country 2 and Donkey Kong Country 3. You know, over the course of this list, I've gotten away with egregiously grouping more than one together in the same spot. I probably won't be able to top putting every multi-cart released at number 100, but grouping the Donkey Kong Country trilogy together may be the silliest one. The first game is iconic but it's sort of a crappy game. If you played through it lately, there's loads of cheap deaths, unfair enemies, just popping up from off screen, killing you without warning. It's the most bullshit one, well, somehow still also being the easiest. It has a legendary soundtrack, and the visuals, I think, still hold up. Some people complain. They say that Donkey Kong Country looks bad now, but I disagree. Imagine the first game is in the 40s or something. Two and three are the ones that buoy the trilogy all the way up here into the top 10. Two is the consensus best, and it's an amazing game. They solved the enemies popping in from off-screen problem. What the first game would do is, often, most enemies would just move along a set pattern. They'd go up and down repeatedly, or they'd go left and right repeatedly, or maybe they'd go in a square if they're really fancy. 2 makes great use of enemies having an alert phase and an idle one. Like, you'll walk on screen, that enemy is minding their own business, only once they notice you on screen and the enemy is in full view of the player do they change into their alert phase and chase after you. It's a minor change and something you don't really think about, but you really feel it. It's a you didn't notice but your brain did moment. You don't get ambushed nearly as much in 2 or 3. 
Instead, the challenge comes from its level design, which is the way it should be, not enemies just appearing because you couldn't see them. Two is amazing, but... Three is my favorite. The level gimmicks get insane in that one. Three hits you early, and it hits you hard. As soon as the fifth stage of the game, you're thrown this wild shit. You turn into this elephant. DKC 1 and 2 would give you a rhino where you just stomp over everyone. But what's this elephant's superpower? Well, it's afraid of mice. Powerful. Whenever you see a mouse, your elephant freaks out and you lose control of him for a couple of seconds. But only when the mouse is in the light. This little would-be background detail is a key component to getting through this stage. You can jump on mice all day long if they're not illuminated, but once it's under that light, you get spooked. And it only gets crazier from here. I'd go over more, but this segment's already kind of gone long. Kitty Kong is stupid, but he's so stupid he's kind of hilarious. Three's the best one. I don't care what anyone else says. Fight me. Seven. Super Mario World. I cannot in good faith rank Donkey Kong Country ahead of Mario World. If I just want to have a fun time, honestly, I would probably reach for one of the DKC games before this most of the time, but calling them superior games would be dishonest on my part. Maybe three. Three might be superior, but one... No way in hell. Unlike ranking Pac-Man 2 higher than A Link to the Past, that's legitimate. Fight me again. After I already beat you up last entry, I'll beat you up again. You know what the deal with Mario World is? It's the same Mario you knew and loved on the NES, only upgraded. With more control over Mario, new power-ups, and Yoshi. Takahashi Tezuka, this game's main director, once claimed in an interview that Miyamoto had quote, drawn a picture of Mario on a horse and hung it on a wall near where he used to sit. I would look at that and think, I think he wants Mario to ride something. Those Nintendo developer interviews and Awada Ask columns were incredible reads sometimes. Miyamoto, by this account, didn't even verbalize a concept for Yoshi. The designers just saw a picture of something on his desk and thought, hey, he must want Mario to ride a horse, and then came up with Yoshi. I like to imagine that's just how game development works at Nintendo. Wario only exists because Miyamoto hung a picture of Mario upside down by mistake. The cat suit in Mario 3D World is from Miyamoto's drawing Princess Peach with cat ears phase. And you don't want to know where Star Fox or Bowser's inside story came from. As for Mario World, it's pretty good. However, the cape breaks the game and Mario 3 is better. So, seven it is. Six, Kirby's Dream Course is the greatest Kirby game ever made. It's not close. It's the greatest golf game ever made. Again, not close. And the second greatest puzzle game ever made. It's the dichotomy between the lighthearted action of Kirby and the most boring sport of all time. You don't play golf as Kirby, you play golf with Kirby, as in he's the ball. It's both a simplified and video gameified take on the sport. There's no clubs or wind or whatever variables are at play in real golf, but in their place are a buttload of power-ups that you activate while the ball is in play. You still have all the options you'd have when hitting a regular golf ball, backspin, topspin, keep it on the ground, basketball jump shot, backspin puts. Here's the real genius mechanic. Instead of just aiming towards one hole, your objective is to defeat all the enemies in the most efficient way you can figure out. Every enemy you defeat gives you a different power up and you can chain these together. If you keep defeating enemies, the last one you don't defeat turns into the hole, so you no longer get whatever enemy that was as power. Not only is finding the easiest path of each objective something you need to consider, but which which order you want to defeat each enemy to get each power up also comes into consideration. Not only that, but whichever power you end a stage with carries over to the next, meaning that you can and will need to plan ahead if you're going for a high score. Plan multiple holes in advance. It includes an in-game leaderboard for each segment, which functions as the par in effect, so you know what scores are actually good. There are also these medallions you can earn, bronze, silver, or gold, and if you manage to get gold in every area, then the game doubles in size, opening up eight new worlds, which I have never done, I will never do. Getting gold in just the first couple of areas is a Herculean task, and I can't imagine doing it in any of the later ones. In those stages, it's a struggle not to just run out of lives. This was only the fourth Kirby game ever, 
and the first of five on the Super Nintendo. And they really took this character out of its comfort zone from its inception. There were two platformers, then a pinball game on Game Boy where, like in this, Kirby himself is the ball, then Dream Course, then a Puyo Puyo reskin. Then when they got around to making a more traditional Kirby game on the SNES, they went psych and released Superstar, a collection of smaller, less fleshed out games. Kirby's tradition of experimentation was solidified here with Dream Course, and to this day, if you ask me, it has never been topped. Five, Uncharted Waters, New Horizons is the ultimate snack food video game. The joy of unraveling our real life Earth is unlike any other. I'm also the kind of nerd who opens up and scrolls random places on Google Maps for fun, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Koei's thing on the Super Nintendo was to bring overly ambitious, borderline unwieldy, idealistic historical simulation to the masses. And they had varying degrees of success. I lumped all of these games together in an entry way earlier on the list but exclude the two Uncharted Waters games. I really like the original, but New Horizons replaces it in just about every way, so... Sorry, original Uncharted Waters, you're off the list. New Horizons is the friendliest and best of these efforts by far. You have six storylines, each of them happening simultaneously, with almost Pulp Fiction-esque interactions. The plot is nothing special, but the way that it's told is masterful. It does an amazing job of melding real-life edutainment, the whimsy of fantasy, and the hard number crunching of a pure bone strategy game. It's one of the most addictive things I've ever played. It's just a sailing simulator it holds up. Uncharted Waters, both the original and New Horizons, are such a tripwire act, but it never feels like too much is going on. There are all these complex mechanics at play, but at any given moment, you're only forced to deal with one or two of them at a time. In New Horizons, each character, for example, has one specialty, and that's what you spend the lion's share of your time doing. Could be cartography, could be buying and selling goods, could be piracy. You're given so much freedom in these games. They can be demanding, but there's a certain reward that comes with that demand. So we've made it to the final four, the last four spots on the list. And I would like to use this as an opportunity to thank you for watching, because if you've made it this far, you're probably going to watch to the end. You know, sunk cost fallacy and all that. You could click off now, or whatever. You could skip ahead to number one and just see that, I guess. But I would also like to use this to thank all of the people who contributed segments, such as Double Dragon Gaming, Flame Guy, the Board Jord, Rock, Furious Action Gamer, Super Bob Hoskins Bros. I'm missing two. Rat Reborn. I'm missing one. And it's not because I like you the least. Oh, pause break. Alex. Sorry. Sorry, you were the last one I thought of. You were the first one to give me your segment, so you're the best. <laughs> anyway, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you for contributing segments. On to the final four. Number four. Earthbound. is the game you either love or you've never finished. There is no in-between. Everyone watching this video has started Earthbound at one time or another, but nobody makes it to the end on their first attempt. I hated this game for years, or at least I thought it to be one of the most overrated. Earthbound is easy to love, but I'd argue easier to hate. I had played through Breath of Fire, I had played through a certain other game which is yet to make an appearance by the time I tried Earthbound, and they were both friendlier, fancier, more substantial it even seemed like. Why the hell is everybody going crazy over this crappy game, I thought? You hit A and a menu pops up? What TF is this Dragon Warrior 1? That's not fun. Then you hit the end of your inventory limit and need to call your sister on the phone so she can send a delivery man to come pick stuff up, but only then three things at a time? That's not fun. It was hard, too. You start the game and it expects you to beat up these older kids, then a full-grown man, then a tank, then literal police officers, it's impossible, unless you grind. And I don't want to grind. Grinding sucks. Grinding's not fun. I made it as far as Paula, and my first attempt ended around when I realized that you cannot ride your bike anymore after she joins. So I wrote it off. 
Sure, once in a while, some NPCs might say something entertaining, but the game itself is terrible. Final Fantasy III, Breath of Fire 2, the game which is yet to be named. Those were the real RPGs worth playing. And this? I didn't get it. I thought people only pretended to like to tolerate Earthbound because it was mildly humorous maybe once every half hour. But it's annoying, looks like shit, and most of the people parroting this, let's be honest, probably haven't even played the game anyway. And that's how I thought about Earthbound for a long time, through all of middle school, through all of high school, and into young adulthood. That was until it came out on Wii U. Maybe it was due to the lack of things to play on the Wii U, especially since that was my main gaming platform at the time. But for whatever reason, God only knows, I gave Earthbound another chance. I still wasn't having an amazing time, but over the years I'd become a more resilient gamer. At 12, teasing me with a bike, Finally, a faster way to travel than snatching it away when you get a second party member because it only has one seat and it would be rude to leave your new friend behind was cruel and unusual punishment. But as a 20-something, that became not only a hilarious joke, but it's downright profound. Of course, as your adventure intensifies, as it involves more people, as you gain more responsibility, like in life, you lose a degree of freedom. I could have looked at all the benefits Paula brought to the table, how your inventory space is now doubled, or how she has powerful magic abilities, or just simply having a second body for enemies to target, but no, I, I didn't. I saw her as the thing standing between me and my bike, and a resentment bred. The lead up to Happy Happy Village is arguably the most difficult bit in the entire game, because you have to do it alone. Sure, you lose the use of your bike, but you're still better off because of her. The addition of Paula is still a net Positive? A second healer? Are you kidding me? Eventually everything clicked. The moment I knew Earthbound was one of the greatest games I had ever played was the house for sale in Ona. If you've played through Earthbound, you know about the house. It's such a beautiful, weighty moment. It makes you laugh and cry simultaneously. If my 12 year old self had made it that far, if they made it to the house, he probably would have been convinced of the exact opposite, that Earthbound was the shittiest game ever conceived. It's a real looking glass moment. It's like in Star Wars when Luke sees himself behind the Darth Vader mask in that cave. Having now finished 44 and counting RPGs for the Super Nintendo for the purpose of review, the idea that Earthbound is too clunky and annoying to be fun is sort of laughable to my sensibilities now, just because I've seen so much worse. But it's a very real concern, especially if you're green. If you're typically a non-RPG player, then I can see how it's its esoteric systems might get in the way of you enjoying it. I know it happened to me. I know it happens to most people who try this game, at least the first time. There are three camps of people with Earthbound. Everyone who's finished it loves the game. Then there's people who pretend to like Earthbound without finishing or even having played it. I think Earthbound is kind of famous for that. Of course, deep down, they're posers who also don't really understand it. And then there's the third camp. People that have played it, made it maybe as far as three, maybe four side, say that they gave it a fair shot, state that it's not great, maybe even that it's overrated. And that's that, they write it off. This is my call out to any of you in the last camp. Earthbound is absolutely worth plugging your nose than forcing yourself to take the rakes until it gets good. Earthbound has its reputation for a reason, and finishing fourth on my list is nothing to be ashamed of. Number three, Super Metroid. So, NES Open is better than Metroid? Flintstones, greater than Metroid. What are you smoking, bro? Metroid deserves to be in the top 10. You can tell you're a young millennial. Anybody that grew up playing the NES would agree that your list of the top 100 games is completely off. How could you put Final Fantasy and Kid Icarus, Metroid, so low on the list. These were two of the most popular games when they came out, and all my friends loved playing these games. And at the time, those graphics were some of the best graphics that any of us had seen. It was a big jump from the graphics where are used to on the Atari most. Yeah, I see you. Did I put the original Metroid 2 low at 52 on my top 100 NES games list? No. Are you... I 
Are you crazy? Have you played Metroid any time in the last 30 years? Have any of you played Metroid before leaving your comment? I could think of 200 NES games off the top of my head. I don't even need a list in front of me that I would rather play if my goal is to have fun. I grew up with the original Metroid. The NES was my first game console. And Metroid was one of the games that I have had my entire life since I was born. I played that all the time as a kid, but it's not like a fun game. I'm sorry, it's not. Super Metroid, on the other hand, I did not grow up with. In fact, I didn't play it for the first time until I was 23 years old. I don't have any nostalgic warm fuzzies for Super Metroid, but I played it and it completely fucking blew my balls off. Holy shit. I guess I just have an immense respect for the most rock solid game design maybe ever. More so than any other game, it allows its geometry, its art, its music, even its controls tell a story. It's nothing groundbreaking what happens in this game, but it's unmistakably there. There's only one Metroid left in the galaxy, it gets stolen, and nefarious forces begin making clones of the thing. They start out shitty, like these bastardized, malnourished Metroids, but by the end they're full-sized and then some, and up. There are much simpler examples, like after you start the game, are these dead bodies? Jesus. You never saw anything like that, not in a Nintendo game anyway. Of course, Super Metroid has some incredible puzzles. Who could forget breaking that glass pipe for the first time, or realizing these animals in the background are supposed to be teaching you how to wall jump, teasing and teaching you something that you could have been doing this entire time. Tutorial text, boo. Locking you into a room and giving weird esoteric hints that you may or may not understand. Yay. The world map itself is a huge puzzle. Who would have thought a game about figuring out where to go next could be so much fun. I am somebody who loads up Google Maps just for fun. So me, I guess. And I don't even like Metroidvanias. I enjoy exactly two of them. Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night. Maybe three with Metroid Dread. Metroid Dread was fine. These two games have duped me into trying many O title over the years, only for me to completely bounce off them. Hollow Knight? More like I'm fucking bored. Every Game Boy Advance and DS Castlevania game? Well, Aria of Sorrow is all right, but the rest of them, who the fuck cares? Throw them away. And even Aria of Sorrow, I've never beaten, I've never finished that game. Super Metroid is so good. It set the standard so high that it has ruined other Metroidvanias for me. And it makes the Game Boy Advance Metroid games look like shit. I think I'm legally required to mention that this game basically invented speedrunning, both intended and non-intended techniques, a naturally non-linear game, one that internally keeps track of how long it took you to beat, and the faster you do it, the less armor Samus is wearing at the end. Which I don't really care what you say, that's cool. So I can't really say much more than Super Metroid, design good, wall jump good, don't care what you have to say about that either, wall jump is good, play it if you haven't. Number two. Chrono Trigger. When putting Chrono Trigger at number two on their very own top 100 Super Nintendo games list, IGN famously claimed that this wasn't the first Japanese RPG, and it certainly won't be the last. Ah, truer words have never been spoken. Chrono Trigger, when it was released, and even still today, is miles above the pale in what you'd expect from a JRPG to be, in terms of pacing and structure. It might be the leanest game I have ever played. There is almost no part of Chrono Trigger which is wasted, or that doesn't serve a purpose. It's a masterclass in getting its own parts to work together in perfect harmony. Even the other greatest JRPGs ever, your Final Fantasy VII's and Persona V's, have bits and folds of flab to them. One of those examples much more than the other. But Chrono Trigger is so compact. Most key story events are foreshadowed. It moves forward with such great purpose and momentum that when they added two new areas to the DS and Steam versions, they stick out like a sore thumb. The game's too compact. You can't fit anything new into this. Those quests might be the normal for any other game, but in Chrono Trigger, normal looks like shit. What is expected in Chrono Trigger, what you expect of other games being present in Chrono Trigger, looks like shit by comparison. The time travel gimmick is used less as a means of puzzle solving, although that is there 
a little bit, and more of a way to link four different concurring plot lines together. The game Squaresoft made before Chrono Trigger, Live Alive, suffers from this. It's an anthology which struggles to effectively connect its disparate vignettes. Chrono Trigger attempts the same Highwire act, and through time travel, it came up with a genius way to work through this dilemma. Everything more or less makes sense plot-wise, which is not an easy thing to do, even without time travel, just writing a story. Even without it consisting of loosely connected pieces, it's hard to get everything down packed. And its attention to detail is sublime. I played through this game, if you include the DS version, probably over 100 times, and I'm not exaggerating. Chrono Trigger lived in my DS for well over a year. I would just New Game Plus continuously and just replay it on loop for months and like over a year at a time. It was the only thing that I played. And I swear... In every playthrough, I would notice one or two other details that I had never seen before. I would discover a new interaction that I didn't know about, or NPC dialogue which foreshadows some late game shenanigans. Most famously, Chrono Trigger is said to have 12 different endings, which is both true and not true at the same time. There are 12 ending set pieces. 13 if you play the Steam or DS versions, but some of these barely count because they don't provide any story closure. They're just like alternate credit sequences. But what people don't count are the variations on set endings. There is no true ending to Chrono Trigger. And that's kind of bizarre, not only for video games, but just for stories in general, to have an open-ended ending. Even games with multiple endings, there's usually one which is clearly better and considered the canon ending. But with Chrono Trigger, you have have one or two primary party members which may or may not be dead. Is your time machine still intact? Was it destroyed? Was your anthropomorphic frog friend transformed back into a human? Or maybe everybody's a frog person now? Is the Chancellor still a monster in disguise? Does Laura have her legs? Did the future refuse to change? There are so many variables even through just one set piece. They sort of screwed themselves out of making sequels that would actually make sense using this approach because with an ambiguous ending, it's hard to have any concrete details to build off of, but within the confines of just Chrono Trigger, it's fitting and maybe even a little ironic. It has been pointed out many times, most recently which I have seen was by Yahtzee Korshaw in his Zero Punctuation review, that your party has shockingly little influence on how history ends up playing out. You spend most of the game witnessing events, attempting to make a difference, only ultimately failing or for another force to come along rendering your deeds pointless. You have such great power in time travel, but for most of the game you feel powerless to really change anything. Only in the last few hours when you're finally able to go anywhere and do anything is when you're able to shape how the story goes, so you have very little agency for most of the game until the end when it can branch off in a million different directions. Chrono Trigger is a miracle video game. If you have ever liked an RPG, you will love Chrono Trigger. If you have never liked or even considered liking an RPG before, then this is the one. If this one doesn't change your mind, then there won't be any games that change your mind. You just don't like RPGs. You are incapable of liking them. It has such broad appeal, while still maintaining as much depth as you want to read into it. When I see other best RPG or best Super Nintendo games of all time lists. I might see shit like Mario RPG or Secret of Mana or Final Fantasy II as high as this, and I get offended. I don't believe that they've actually played all these games at that point, because it is clearly so much better than all those games. There are only a select few which I could field an argument for being better than Chrono Trigger. And even then, they're mostly losing ones. You can't point to anything and say that it's better than Chrono Trigger. You just can't. It's basically the perfect video game. Having said that, what the frick could possibly be number one then? First, let's recap.
That's right. Number one is Dragon Quest V. Three years ago, I came to you live in the flesh to tell you about the time that my dad died. He stole thousands of dollars from his girlfriend, ran away, got fucked up on drugs, and then died. Not quite as heroic as the dad in Dragon Quest V, but hey, I'll take what I can get as far as comparisons go. Dragon Quest V is nowhere near the structural masterpiece that both Chrono Trigger and Super Metroid are, but it's got the same dry literary wit that Earthbound has while at the same time being an actual heart-touching story about moving on and finding your place in the world. It's not going to blow you away with its game design chops because it's just kind of a stereotypical JRPG, but they had learned so much from entry to entry that each one becomes closer to an ideal perfect, traditional, turn-based, Dragon Quest-styled game. And I think they achieved that perfection here. If you're going to make a pure turn-based, overworld with towns, vaguely medieval, only with magic and monsters and stuff, you know the type, all the old tropes, then it doesn't get better than Dragon Quest V. I don't mean that you can't find a better game strictly in this style, I mean you couldn't have possibly made a better one. Not only does it not exist, it can't exist. You could add a run button or something to this. There's no run button when I'm stuck in traffic. Life in video games and art aren't always going to be high octane the whole time. They aren't always going to be the most user-friendly things in the world, and that's okay. If they were, you'd just be numb. You can't just always have no struggle in your life ever. That's not how it works. I really could have put any of these last three games in any order, but having Chrono Trigger or Super Metroid number one is much more boring than having Dragon Quest V. Like how I probably could have put Mario 3 as my number one NES game and not lost sleep over it, Dragon Quest 4 and Zelda 2 are just much more interesting choices. There's a certain amount of gamesmanship that comes into crafting these lists. I once reviewed this game for 42 minutes, which is shocking even to me, because how could I possibly have 42 minutes worth of things to say about this game. The answer is I don't and didn't. You could safely stop watching that video after about 15, but it's a defining video for my YouTube career whether I like it or not. I really can't go back and watch the things that I did that long ago, and in the grand scheme of things, it's only been three years, which isn't much time at all. So yeah, Dragon Quest V. As soon as number one is revealed, everybody stops watching these kinds of things anyway, so... I know that I'm speaking to exactly zero people right now, but shout out to every single person who watched this monster to the end. Shout out to all of my patrons. That money has come in so clutch over the past ten months. Seriously, you guys have no idea. And I never do this, but like the video, tell people about it if you enjoyed it. I don't care if you subscribe. In fact, if you don't think you're going to watch any more of my content, then don't subscribe. Those are my top 100 Super Nintendo games of all time. Hope you enjoyed. Dragon Quest V is a fantastic game. You should all play it. I don't care if it's the Super Nintendo or DS remake, but just try it out. It's great. And shout out to William Robert Lee, of course, as always. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.